Oh. Hello, Cockfoster. Blimey, quarter past two. I'm sorry to wake you, Mr. Cockfoster. It's Detective Sergeant Frogman here. I'm at the scene of a murder. Go on. The corpse has had its head cut off. Charming. Go on. He's the vice chairman of the police committee. Name of Vic Troller. Wonderful. I don't know if you've met him. No, and now I don't expect I will. <laughs> no, sir. Living? Uh, no, he's dead. I know he's dead. I said, what did he do for a living? Oh, a financial and property consultant. What's the address? The Coppers, Mel's Drive. Uh, Copper Beach is not our kind of coppers. I don't want the roots and derivations. Just tell me where it is. It's halfway along Mel's Drive. Very grand part of town. A big half-timbered place set well back from the road. There's no number on the gate, but there's a red telephone box on the pavement right outside. Did you say a red telephone box? Yes, sir. Are there any other colour in this town? Uh, no, sir. Sorry, sir. Actually, that's where I'm speaking from. From a red telephone box? Yes, sir. The phone in the house has been disconnected. Ripped out. I see. This geezer's head. Is it about the place? No, sir. We're looking for it now. OK. On my way. Darling, are you awake? <sighs> Duty call, sweetheart. I'll try to get back for a bite of breakfast. Uh, now, don't forget the man's coming to fit the carpet in the morning. <sighs> you said to remind you that Finchfield's carpet... Never mind, darling, go bye-byes. Now, where's that other sock? Good morning, sir. Morning. I'm Chief Inspector Cockfoster. Who are you? Oh, blimey. Wait a bit, Arthur Mo. Well, fancy meeting you here. Benjamin Dobell in person. Now, what's your part in these horrible doings? Nothing, Mr. Cockfoster. I'm Snow White. I was in bleeding bed one night. What are you doing in the frozen north? I'm trying to earn me living. An honest one. Butlin. Oh, no, I've heard it all. Where's the law? Uh, there's one named Frogman in the study with the body. Three out the back, looking for the nut. Looked under your bed, have they? What? Which is the study? Oh, uh, second on the left. Ah. Uh, I'll get that if it's okay with the butler's union. Shove off and polish the nutcrackers. Yes, Mr. Cook, for start. Hello, what can I do for you? Dr. Lamb, police surgeon. Good, come in. I'm also Mr. Victoria's personal physician. Well, that's handy. Wait a minute, it's Lamb, the leg breaker. Pardon? Oh, I was at the match on Saturday. Oh, oh. <laughs> I should really introduce myself. Uh, Raymond Cockfoster, new ICCID. We've just moved up here. Uh. Your bowling action was very reminiscent. Very reminiscent. You never played for the county. Thanks, but I'm not that good. No, too good for club cricket in the northern wastes. It's years since I saw googlies like that. Howsomever, come and view the body. Oh, by the way, I'll be coming to see you with my prostate. Huh? Uh, this way, Doctor. And so, what do you make of it so far, Frogman? Well, obviously foul play. Full marks? The body's lying behind the desk. Well, as you see, so I take it he was sitting there when it happened. What happened? Um, oh, he could have been shot. Then... Whoever it was, yanked off the head so we wouldn't find the bullet. How was the head taken off, Doc? It looks as if it's been sawn. Neat job. Well, effective. Any other offerings, Frogman? It is possible this isn't Mr. Victrola at all. The shoes are on the wrong feet. It's possible somebody dressed him in Mr. Victrola's clothes and in the heat of the moment slipped up on the shoes. Which seems a very silly mistake. Yes, sir. Well, Doctor... Is it Victrola or ain't it? Can you tell in the absence of the loaf? I won't know until I've had a good look in the mortuary. But then you'll know for certain. Well, not absolutely. He's never had any chronic organic problems, as far as I can remember. No operation scars. Fortunate man. Until now. Won't the fingerprints do? Oh, this place should be full of them. His office, his secretary's... Secretary's what? 
office. You were going to say something else. Secretary's flat. Ah, like that, was it? Yes, it might have to be Prince, but I much prefer teeth. Well, I can let you go now, Doc. We'll have him in the morgue in about an hour. Let me know what you find in the morning. I'll do my best. Oh, Doc. Uh, yes? I must say, I admire your daring. Daring? What do you mean? Your cool audacity. What are you referring to? Cricket. What else? Your slow bowling. Aha. <laughs> yes, it takes true guts to toss up such lazy-looking deliveries. Of course, you impart a lethal spin. <laughs> I do my best. The art of deception? Quite. I rejoice to see it. Thank you. On the cricket pitch. I beg your pardon? I'd have enjoyed betting against you. Oh, you were a batsman. You see before you a man who topped the Metropolitan Averages 1963 to 1968. Really? Well, perhaps we could have a session in the net. Huh. I look forward to the contest with some relish, although my eyesight isn't what it was. Yes, well, good night, Inspector. Good night. Tell you what, Frogman, we'll set up shop in here. Right, sir. Where's his wife? In bed. She knows she's a widow? She got up and took a look. And? She was very disturbed. Ah, I'll go and have a word. Where's her room? Uh, straight up. Turn left. Along the corridor, door facing you. I'll nip up there now. Hello, Dobell. Can't sleep. We're joking. Why are you loitering on the landing? I'm just going to bed. I'll see you later. Am I right for the mistress of the house? Yeah. That door there. Thought so. Good night, Dobell. I said, scram. Stop hanging about like a gentleman's gentleman. Sorry, Mr. Cock Foster. Come on, I know you ain't asleep. Okay. Stick em up. Oh, yeah? I said, stick em up, cowboy. They're up, they're up. Close the door. Right, right. What do you mean, riding your horse into my bedroom? I'll take him out, shall I? No. Leave him there. Give him some hay and come over and sit on my bed. I like your style. Oh, that's fine. I like yours. You think we could be partners? Why not? Stick up a bag together? Uh, not likely. Why not? No guts? I'm a policeman. I like your honesty. Oh, tell. And I like your horse. He's well-bred, I will say that. So, in reality, you belong to me. In what sense? The entire police force belongs to me. They were left to me in my father's will. Also, the patrol cars and police horses. My husband stole them, every one. No wonder you did him in. The Royal Air Force belongs to me, too. All those fine aeroplanes, mine. Your husband stole them? The government. Saving hyenas. Like to see my workshop? What, out of the back? It's three in the morning. No, no, in the next room through there. Come on, I'll show you. Uh, wait, uh, you've got no clothes on. This is a nudist colony. Oh. Through here, please. There. Now, swear you won't steal anything. On oh, my mother's deathbed. What are you, a carpenter? Cabinet maker. I was apprenticed to Chippendale. Cool. It was a mistake. How so? He stole my legs. Lovely tool. Get your thieving paws off, monsieur. Sorry. Bow saws, fret saws, panel saws, chain saws, rip saws, axe saws, surgical saws. All beautifully cleaned and oiled. Of course. I was apprenticed to Hepplewhite. He stole you both front. Who heard about that? One of these here saws could cut a man's head off. Easily. I've done it several times. Mind you, don't lose yours. One inch enough to a wise man. I'll say night-night. Where are you going? To stable me horse. Come on, Dobbin. Night-night. Hello. The Berlin Philharmonic. Hello, Mr. Cockfuster. Sounds like Marla. How would you know? I know everything. Mind if I switch off? 
Enough. No more. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. Yeah. Tis a bit sad. Well, it's your Marlo, isn't it? Where'd you pick up a taste for the Vienna School? Music Appreciation Club, Parkhurst. You want the Barbara Olive version? I served a stretch with Fernando Musaka, the Mad Axe composer. In what done in the conductor for bringing in the piccolos too early? We had many a musical evening together in the top security wing. Here, they let him bring in his own grand piano. What did you play, the Aeolian Kush? No. I used to... That's enough of your artistic memoirs. Save them for the third programme. Now, what are you doing in these parts, son? <laughs> Could ask you the same, couldn't I? Lip. How much did all this stereo gear cost you? It's all brand new. Yeah, and new records. It's all paid for. You want to see the receipts? Paid for with what? Savings. My behind. How much was this geezer paying you? A hundred a week and all found. How long have you been at liberty? Six weeks. When did you last see your master? Mr. Victrola. Well, this morning. I brushed his dandruff off when he left for work. He didn't come out for dinner. Was that unusual? No, he hardly ever did. Couldn't stand his wife's conversation. We was all in bed by about eleven. We still hadn't come home. Sometime after one, I heard his car draw up on the gravel. You was still awake? I was playing Shostakovich on the stereo. I suffer from insomnia. He didn't go down and make him a cocoa. He wouldn't have thanked me. So... He could have brought somebody in with him. Yeah. Or somebody could have crept downstairs to him. Yeah. What finally took you downstairs? Do you know Shostakovich's eight symphony? Not intimately. Well, a brass section has some terrific shrieking climaxes. Here, I'll play you a bit if you like. Now, get on with it. You suit yourself. Well, the record come to an end and I drew the covers up to me chin. I was about to nod off when I realised something. There'd been a shriek I never remember before. I put the record on again. The shriek wasn't there. Well, I lay down and I thought about it for a bit. Then I sat up and I realised the shriek must have come from somewhere else. But I went downstairs and I found him. Top like a soft-boiled egg. Why did Vic Trowler want the heavyweight? He wanted a butler, didn't he? A butler? A butler. Well, why did he want a muscle man? Who was he scared of? Arabs. Tar. We'll have further words later. Oh, uh, what do you make of the mistress of the house? <laughs> She's not as loopy as she makes her. What makes you say that? She fends people off. There are men inside exactly like that. Form of protection, isn't it? How does she run the house? Like a quartermaster. She can handle money. Ah, they always can. Anybody tries to rob her, she goes for the axe. Result, she don't get robbed. Right, I'll see you. This i-fi gear cost a few thousand quid. I saved up for it. What, in six weeks? Mr. Peter Royal, that right? Yes. So you're the deceased's nephew. You live in the top story and write plays. Yes. That must be interesting. Well... Yes, yes, indeed. Sold any to Hollywood? No, I write chiefly uh, critiques of society. Oh, yeah. Plays of, well, social relevance. Police staggery, racism, that kind of thing. Well, occupied on what at this precise moment? A piece in praise of the Palestine struggle. Pro-Palestine? Pro-humanity. Good for you. Any money in there? I don't do it for money, surprisingly enough. Oh, you write to change society. I get it. Very worthy, too. I applaud you for it. Did you by any chance do this geezer in? No. <laughs> I only slay them in print. I'm a fearful coward, actually. Now then, Miss Victrola, you were... Miz. Beg pardon? Miz. Miz. Where? Oh. Ah, oh, not Miss or Mrs., but, uh, could I call you Angela, is it? Miss, call me Miss Victrola. How old are you, uh... Eighteen last month. You were out when this happened? Right. At one, two in the morning? Right. Doing what, may I ask? <laughs> you have exactly the same tone as my father. Doing what, may I ask? Rallying. Oh. 
Margaret rallying. Correct. Did you win? No, I got lost. Oh, huh. friend of Mark Thatcher's, are you? Ha, ha. What about your navigator? That's why I got lost. I didn't have one. He had to finish a who done it. You what? To write a play. He does it for a living. Ah, oh, you mean upstairs, right, a fella? Yes, my cousin Peter. Did you say who done it? I thought he wrote, uh, what is it? Plays of social relevance. Oh, yes, that's when he's Peter Royal. But then when he writes who done it, he's Fred Martin. Is he indeed? Now, I'm glad you told me that. Morning, sir. Uh, morning, Fogman. Been here all night, sir. Yeah, going through his letters. Half of them in Arabic. Got to translate the line up. Uh, don't take your coat off. I want you to go and break the news to his secretary, right. Belinda Ruby. Ask her to... Cock Foster. Oh, hello, darling. Uh, sorry, I... What, already? It's only just gone nine. Took our carpet away? What for? What's your measure? 22 by 16. Why? 21 by 17. 21 by 17. There's something wrong with their tape measure. Yeah, like I always do, by proceeding across the room, placing one foot in front of the other. Yeah, OK, so I might have got it wrong, but listen. Now, no, uh, listen, darling. You should not have let them cart it away. That is a 15,000 quid doormat we're talking about. What? No. As a dedicated pessimist, I'm convinced we'll never see it again. That is a 15,000... Scissors? Oh, you did. Oh, thank God. What do you mean, they have ways of making it fit? I don't like the sound of that at all. What were those measurements again? 21 by 17? What do they propose? Stretching one side and shrinking the other? I'm not raising my voice only when somebody makes dire threats against my carpet. I... Yeah, yes. Yeah, all's well that ends well. Yeah. What are they named again? Finchfields. Yeah, right. Yes, I'll try and be in for lunch, but don't count on it. Bye. Know anything about Finchfields carpets? A little shop in Kirkland Gate. Any good? A fitting carpets? Couldn't say. Now, where were we? Belinda Ruby. Oh, yes. She was apparently more than his shorthand typist, so be gentle, but stay alert. Hello? Oh, come in, Doctor. Morning. Off you go, Fogman. Right, sir. Good look at the body? Yes. And? Well, I'm 99% convinced. It's Victrola. Victrola's very shapely hands. You still sound doubtful. <laughs> Trouble is, I only examined him once in any depth. For an insurance policy. He carry a lot of insurance. I wouldn't know. How long have you known him? Hmm, five years. You've been in this town five years? Well, getting on for seven now. How do you survive it as one southerner to another? Well, it's not a town that welcomes strangers. For instance, a Cockney accent is highly suspicious. Well, that makes my wife a leper. Not to mention yours truly. Would you like to bring her to tea at my place? I've got beautiful honey. Oh, so... That's very kind of you. Uh, where do you live? I've got a cottage a couple of miles from here. Keep bees, grow flowers. Sounds idyllic. Your wife's not mine, Cockney. Oh, I, I'm not married. That's suspect, too. I could tell Mrs. Cockfoster about the best butchers and grocers and where to buy good glass and linen. Oh, tell very much. And you could teach me the googly. Uh, oh, uh, by the way... What do you know about Finchfield's carpets? Oh, quite a good name. I've never dealt with them. Well, here's my problem. I have this carpet. Well, my wife has this carpet. Well, we both have this carpet. <laughs> nice length of Aubusson. Family heirloom made for the ancestral home by the wife's grandma, Lady Clutterbuck. Measures 22 foot by 16. Now, our new drawing room measures 21 by 17. Got it? <laughs> carpet... 22 by 16, drawing room, 21 by 17. Now, how do you get out of that one? Well, knock a wall down. Move it back a foot. Knock a wall down? Ah, but that still leaves a one-foot gap down the side. Put in a one-foot cavity wall. Sounds a bit drastic. 
Now, you see, uh, uh, let me find a bit of paper. It's Mr. Finchfield himself I want. No, I do not want the fit in form, and I want the head codge of the lodge. Gone to lunch at eleven in the morning? Gone to lunch in London. OK, pass this on to that fit in foreman. Tell him not to touch Cock Foster's carpet until further notice. Got then? Pass it on. Goodbye. Sir, she's flown. Belinda Ruby. Packed her traps and gone. Nicker draws empty. The lot. Passport everything. Sam. She's made off. Port's alerted, sir. If that geezer with no top ain't Victrola. Yes, sir. It looks like he's set this all up so that he can fly the coop. Yes, sir. I want the fraud squad in that office. <sighs> Ten o'clock, Frogman. Yes, sir. You can go home if you have one. Oh, yes, sir. You stay in the night again. No, I want to go through this fraud squad stuff again. Oh, uh, by the way, sir, I'll thank you to stop making eyes at Miss Victrola. Oh? Miss Victrola. Miz, don't let those big grey eyes and hair the colour of ripe corn warp your judgment. I'll see who that is, sir. Frogman here. Oh, marvellous. Terrific. She's what? Oh, no. Badly? Can you get her back here, or do you want... No, no, I'll bring her back if she's fit to travel. Cheers. Yes. Thank you. Belinda Ruby? Yes, sir. Hotel in Liverpool. The ambassador. Ah, what does that mean? America? Isle of Man? She's been hit on the head. They found her wandering about the corridors from Cust. They're bringing her back. Liverpool? What's that? Twenty miles? Shouldn't take more than half an hour? Belinda Ruby? Age? Twenty-eight. I get this down, Frogman. Sir? So what happened, Miss Ruby? I was rung at midnight on Tuesday and told to go to the Ambassador Hotel in Liverpool, room 56, to pack a bag, passport, money, certain documents. Rung by whom? A hotel receptionist, a man speaking for Mr. Victrola. Accent? Sorry? Accent of the receptionist. Oh, Liverpool, I suppose. Uh, go on. So that's what I did. I drove to Liverpool, parked in front of the hotel, went up to number 56. Then? I knocked on the door. Yes? It swung open. There was no light in the room, but the light from the corridor, it was enough to show Ray in a chair smiling at me. Ray? Raymond, Mr. Victrola. What did he say? He said nothing. He simply smiled, and I stepped into the room towards him. Then there was a sudden sound behind me, a, a scuffle, and then a god almighty blow on the head. The next thing I knew, I was walking along a corridor, on a completely different floor, they tell me, and a small man with a big ginger beard was propping me up and clicking his tongue, you know, disapprovingly. Hmm? He thought I was drunk. Ah. Victrola was in a chair, sitting? Yes. Smiling? Yes. You were under the impression he called you there to fly the coop? I'm sorry? You'd gone there to flee the country with him. It didn't surprise you. You were ready to do a vanishing trick. No, it didn't surprise me. He'd robbed people blind and was getting out. Not exactly. Approximately. That's what the press will say. They'll make a feast of it. Was anything missing when you came round? The money. How much? Fifteen thousand. What? We always kept a fifteen thousand float for emergencies. Anything else missing? Certain documents. Business documents. Ah, uh, okay. Mr. Blinder of the Fraud Squad will talk to you about those. Are you feeling fit? Quite well, considering. Only, I'd like you to cast your eye over a body with no head. What? And Frogman. Sir? Fingerprint the ambassador. Yeah. You mean the room? I mean the ambassador. Oh, good morning. Could I possibly speak to Mr. Finchfield? Ten o'clock. OK, I'll ring back at ten. And meanwhile, I want nobody to touch Cook Foster's carpet. Pass it on. OK, Frogman, sir. Let's just recap on the scoreboard. This geezer vanishes in a snowstorm of bouncing checks and business swindles. Or does he? In Victrola's home, office car, we found a million fingerprints that fit the corpse. More dabs than une de manche à la grande jatte. 
If that stiff ain't Victrola, he went everywhere Victrola went and touched everything Victrola touched. Even at the ambassador in Liverpool? Yes, one set of prints on Victrola's cigar case under his pillow. Could be a blonde. Victrola could have hired the corpse to do it. To run around touching everything he touched. Oh, no, that's not humanly possible. Don't be so dogmatic, Frogman. Eh? We are deep in the area of bluff, double bluff and triple bluff. And in this game, Victrola excelled. Now, what else have we? Reactions to viewing the body in the morgue. The secretary says the body is definitely Victrola. Well, she would. It's a good get-out. The daughter and nephew have no idea. Well, fair enough. Or is it? Would you know your dad without his loaf? Think about it. His wife says it's Anthony Eden. Who done it, Frogman? Who done what, if it comes to that? Was your husband in the habit of smoking a cigar in bed? What would I know of his nocturnal hobbies? I was only the wife. Apart from yourself, Mrs. Victrola, who do you think might wish to murder your husband? Can you talk of nothing else? Have you no other topics of conversation? I'm investigating a murder. There you go again. You're obsessed with this subject. It's very unhealthy. You're in danger of boring the bloomers off me. Have you no small talk? Very well. What do you know about Finchfield's carpets? They don't fly. Is that so? They are not magic. Yet they carry a certificate of airworthiness. It bears examination. I'll look into it. Do. Look. I'll tell you the truth. Open your notebook. Write this down. My husband flew away. I saw him go. In a comet. British Airways comet? Halley's comet. It was directly over this roof on Tuesday night. <laughs> he won't be back for 70 years. He's outwitted you. Why aren't you writing this down? It's embossed on my skull. All the telephone boxes belong to me. Why did you suddenly say that? What? About the telephone boxes belonging to you. Because it happens to be true. The red ones? Lapis lazuli. you lie. Not the one outside your gate. Has that one come back? I keep chewing it away. It's always hanging around here. So I'd noticed. It's ringing pathetically to be fed. Are you as daft as you make out? Do you mean, am I masquerading as a lunatic? Yes. That I have yet to establish. So have I. But I'm on the right track. I can't say I am. And don't keep me long. I'm in a car rally tonight. Pardon? Car rally. Pack it in, get on with it. This is Friday night. I know. Your pa died late Tuesday, early Wednesday. So what? Doesn't seem decent. Hurry up. What do you want to know? Was your pa strict with you? You're in a backward northern town, Mr. Cockfoster. This is still a savagely repressive society. And in that respect, my dad was a proper ayatollah. Worse, because he didn't do it from any religious or ideological motives. What were his motives? The same as yours with your children. What are those? I sometimes wonder. Oh, that's simple enough. You want us all in the same moral straitjacket you were in when you were young. Couldn't you say the same for the actual Ayatollah? So, you admit you're an Ayatollah. I'm not here to bandy words with an impudent chit. Is Peter Royal your lover? Did your pa discover his own house was I even a free love? Are you blind? Did they send you here for a rest cure? Alistair Lamb and Peter are the lovers. Dr. Lamb? Yes, Alistair Lamb. Of course, I have slept with Peter. You have to be friendly living under the same roof. It's only polite. Dad had a string of lovers. He ran away with the first one when I was born. It turned Mum mental. Oh, come in, Frogman. What is it now? A report on the fingerprints at the ambassador. Can I go? Uh, just a minute. Any joy? Well, there were five criminals in residence, of one sort or another. It's a big hotel. Anyone we know? No, not really. Oh, tell me later. Sit down, sir. I was just finishing with Miss... Uh, with Miss... Miss... Okay, get on with it. You always refer to your pa in the past tense. So you're certain he's dead. And what? On the contrary. I know he's alive. I? How? I've seen him. When? The night after he's supposed to have lost his head. Where? At the kitchen window. In this house? What was he doing? Smiling at me. Smiling at you? This is a load of codswallops. Okay. D didn't you go out and speak to him? Yes, I ran out, but he'd gone. What time was this? Um, 
Just after eight in the evening. Why didn't you come and tell me? I was here at the time. And give him away? Why so keen to protect him all of a sudden? Well, I do love him. Biologically, unavoidably, umbilically, it can't be helped. You're giving him away now. But he's in South America by now. Or wherever. If you did your part in, darling, this is just the kind of tale you'd tell. Well, so it is. Look, I really must show. You've got sweet motives. He was a hypocritical tyrant. He turned your moral mental and you stand to inherit. Inherit what? He owed millions. Inherit this house. I imagine it's a company house. We'll all be on the street. That doesn't seem to worry you. Oh, if Anna wills, so be it. Can I go now, please? Okay. Send your cousin in. Don't keep him long. He's navigating. You fancy that little baggage frogman? Yes, sir. Why not? What would your wife think? Oh, she wouldn't really care. She's broad-minded. How old are you? Twenty-nine. First wife? Second, sir. Men of my age are on thinking sands. One, two, three, uh, four... Sir, what's he up to? Five. Measuring this study. Eh? If it's going on the market, I quite fancy it as a setting for a certain family heirloom. Now, where was I? Four? Five. Four. Five. Oh, damn you, Fogman, I'll start again. You wanted me? Oh, come in, Mr. Royal. Or is it Fred Martin? Ah. Very naughty of you, hiding your light under a bushel. Any excuse? I like to keep Fred dark. People wouldn't take Peter Royal seriously if they knew he hammered away at who done it. You do surprise me. I should have thought it would be the other way round. Oh, no. I'd have sworn it was. Who done it, say? So you excel in the art of bluff, double bluff, and triple bluff. Hardly excel. It's hardly an art. How some ever. I'm very interested. Tell me about this who done it you had to finish. Must I? Please. I have a car rally. And I've a murder inquiry. Now, this who done it of yours? It's called Death on Delivery. About cricket? No, this couple receipt. Do we really have to plod all the way through this? The bare outlines. <sighs> this couple receive a huge packing case one morning. Stop. There. I'm booked already. If it had been socially important, I'd have been nodding off by now. Go on, boy. They haven't a clue what it can be. It's nailed tight and secured with a wire, you know. Oh, I know. Stapled and so forth, with the lettering burnt into the wood. That's right. So the husband sends the wife for a claw hammer and pincers and so on. You know, Frogman, mm -hmm. in a socially relevant play, the husband would have fixed the tools himself, or at least a social point would have been made. Am I right, Mr. Royal? Well, maybe. Anyway, when she returns a couple of minutes later, the husband's nowhere to be found. The moose. Are you enjoying this, Frogman? Oh, uh, quite interesting, sir. Uh, sorry, uh, go on with the tale. She looks everywhere. Not a sign of him. In the end, she calls for the police. I mean, he was in his dressing gown and so on. The plot thickens. So the police arrive. A couple of lads in a panda car. It's nightfall by now. That's right. It will be. The upshot is, after poking all over the place, they finally open the packing case, which is still nailed up. And the husband's body is inside. Dead? Suffocated. Superb. How do you get there? Professional no secret. You know what? I'm not going to tell you. Listen, on the law... Be that as it may. I could do you for obstructing the police. Over a fictional crime? I'll bet you don't know. Have it your way. Don't worry, I'll work it out. Listen, Cock, have you got any more where that came from? Can I please get off to my car rally? This car rally sounds mighty important. Not, not more than any other car rally. So stop fidgeting. Tell me just one more. What was the last one you wrote? The red telephone box. Red? Not O'Daniel, not Humbug Stripes. No, Red. Why? Very well. The plot. A man is being shadowed by the police. Tailed. A mole. A man or a mole? Oh, <laughs> yes, I'll get you. Uh, carry on. He goes into a telephone box. Post office rig. Just a common or garden phone box on a busy corner in broad daylight. And he doesn't come out again. Right. He disappears. Yes. Sucked up the wire by a man with a straw. In actual fact, no. There is a logical answer. There always is. I fail to see how this helps in the case of my uncle. It helps me to see how your mind works. Good night, Fred. Bon voyage. Good night. There's always a logical answer, Frogman. Yes, sir. 
Howsomever, confusion here has made her masterpiece. I think they're putting me through an IQ test to see if I'm worthy of this post. Vice Chairman of the Police Committee drew the short straw to be guinea pig. <laughs> More likely the chuster it. Tells you when, as you lose. <laughs> as you lose. Oh, uh, sorry, sir. Coco, gentlemen. Oh, Chardo, Bill. Bring it over here. Drink it up while it's warm. Your kindness is all the more prized, Obel, because it comes from a dedicated mobster, blackmailer, and probably murderer. Is he being sarcastic again? And draw those curtains. I'm not your bleeding butler, Mr. Cockfoster. Lip. Sorry, Mr. Cockfoster. And get that on your way out. Good evening. 31036. Mrs. Victrola's residence. Dobell speaking. Oh, Frogman, uh, yeah. give me that report on the fingerprints at the hotel. Yeah, right, yes. What? Cooper, burglar. Okay. Snodman, burglar. Yeah. Whistler, burglar. Yeah. Pluck, soliciting. Flanders, yeah. burglar. Henry Pluck, yeah. persistent soliciting in yeah. public yeah. loos. Yeah. Henry well, Pluck. It's Dr. Lamb for you, Mr. Cockfoster. Now, I'll give it here, will you? Here you are, Gov. Well, I'll just be off for my nightcap. Scotch? Das Lied von der Erde. Hello, Doc. What can I do for you? Hello, Chief. I'm ringing from home. How are you? Well, this perishing prostate makes my eyes water. I don't mind telling you. But I'll see you about that some other time. No, no. But I've just had a little idea. I was wondering... Uh, what's that bell I can hear? It's my doorbell. I must have visitors. And you better answer it. I suppose I have. Uh, would you mind holding on a moment, or shall I ring you back? You go and see who it is. I'll hold on. Nothing spoiling this end. Sorry about this. Back in a minute. I'll tell you what, Frogman. Yes, sir? How you fit a 22 by 16 carpet into a 21 by 17 space remains the most baffling mystery. Oh. Of course. Alfred Hitchcock might disagree. What, uh, the film director? He once had the notion of starting a film in a car factory. Oh. The detective and the foreman of the works walked together alongside the conveyor belt, watching a car being assembled. Now, to start with, it's just a couple of nuts and bolts. But bit by bit, the entire car takes shape before their eyes. You there, Doc? No, he ain't. Finally, they reach the end of the conveyor belt. The car stands before them, shining in all its splendour. As they look... The door swings open, and a man's body falls out. <laughs> What's the explanation? Alfred Hitchcock couldn't find one. He never made the film. Cockfoster! My God! Cockfoster! Are you there? It was? Uh, yes, yeah, still here. Something wrong? It's terrible! Horrible! You've got to get over here! Now, calm down, son. Do the bedside manner. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Take a nice, deep breath, Doc. You done that? Now... Tell me nicely and calmly what's bothering you. Sorry. There's a head on my doorstep. A man's head. What? When you just opened the door? I opened the door. There was nobody there. A car was driving away. I stepped out here to look at it. Couldn't see a damn thing. It was going so fast. I just stepped out to see who it was, and I tripped over this... this thing right in the middle of my doorstep. Somebody's head? It rolled onto the gravel like a turnip. And it's him, is it? Who? It's Victrola. No, it's Dobell. Dobell? Dobell, the butler Dobell. Dobell? I think you're mistaken. Look again. Cockfoster, he's gazing up at me at this moment, and I tell you, it's Dobell. Dobell's here. Well, his head's here. Uh, one moment. Uh, Frogman, sir. go up and find Dobell. Quick. Right, sir. Frogman's just going to get him. <laughs> I tell you, it can't be Dobell. Dobell's here. Flaming Hades, he just spoke to you on this telephone. He handed this blood over to me so I could talk to you. He walked out of this room not two or three minutes ago. I know, I know that. Now just calm down, son. There's a logical answer for everything. Will you just get over here damn fast? I'd really appreciate that. Right you are, son. Don't you worry your head. Go and give yourself a nice tranquilizer, OK? And I'll be seeing you soon, OK? Right. Hmm, humbra, humdrum brother. No sign of him. No sign of Dobell. He's disappeared. Now, don't you start. Well, he might have slipped out for a walk. Look what I found. What? In his room. 
Fifteen grand on his bed. Never mind fifteen grand, I want dope. Fifteen grand? That's what Belinda Ruby lost at the Ambassador. I don't know about you, but my head's whirling round like a Battersea chair ride. Come on. Where to? Dr. Lamb. Thank God, what kept you? Come in. He says, what kept us? You've been a good 25 minutes. It's a two-mile ride. Where were you? He says, where were we? Car had a flat. Stop there in the driveway with a flat. When we looked in the boot, there was no spare. Had to raise a blooming patrol car. Know how long that took? God help the people. Oh, some of us. Where's the nut? There. Oh, I beg his pardon. So it is. Great. Cool. Now, is that or is it not Dobell? Frogman? Is that, or is it not? It's his identical twin. What? What? This is Dobell's identical twin. Did he have an identical twin? Well, he must have had an identical twin. This is him, so where's Dobell? Well, this can't be Dobell. But why not? Don't start that again. Let's all keep our heads. <laughs> keep our heads. Frog man. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Coo. That's all I can say. Coo. From a cursory look, Doc, was this unfortunate bonce chopped off or sawn off? Well... I'd say a surgical saw. Nice job, too. Nice? Did you say nice? A professional, practised, adept. I'll tell you something. This is not a case of what the butler saw. Pardon, sir. More like who saw the butler. <laughs> I can't help thinking. Yes. Poor old Dobell. He'd have gone a lot happier if it had been a musical saw. Sir, you realise this is totally impossible. Two minutes after he left us... His head was on this doorstep. All right, check up. See if Dobell had an identical twin, sir. Doctor. Ah, sorry? Why did you call me? Call you? Why did you ring me up? Oh, gone completely out of my head. I wanted to invite you and Mrs. Cockfoster to Sunday tea. Sunday tea? Oh, tell very kindly. Uh, when's that? Uh, day or uh, tomorrow? Yeah, we'll come. Tar ever so. Here we are. Saturday afternoon, the sun launching in through the leads and making this old carpet purr like a cat. What's he reading? Wisdom, the cricketer's almanac. A very old copy of Wisdom. If I can't watch the cricket, I'll read about it. Wonder how many of the doctors bowled out today with his googlies. Now let's run through the bowling figures just once more. Sir? Sure. At the time of Dobell's disappearance, Miss Miz and Peter called Fred were on a car rally. They got lost. You think they could have done two miles in two minutes and cut off a nut en route? No. The doctor was at home talking to me on the phone and answering the door. Belinda Ruby was in hospital with a relapse of her concussion. Mrs. Victrola... Was in her room when I went up to look for Dobell. I popped in to see if he was with her. She was at the window, moaning about that telephone box foul in the pavement. The red telephone box? No. She didn't see it from her room. Or so it seems. I took her word for it. <laughs> she said somebody was feeding it. Bananas? Oh, plain bonkers. No, she said somebody was feeding it bananas. Uh, licorice all sorts. Licorice all sorts? Giant licorice all sorts. Maybe you're right, sir. Bonkers. <laughs> or maybe you ain't. Somebody is wriggling, Frogman. Sir, the second killing is always the mark of a desperate person. Furthermore, somebody suffers from an excess of ingenuity, an overdose of deviousness. Some devious old pike is wriggling and threshing, and when that happens, in my experience of fishing, the pike is almost landed. Now wait. Licorice all sorts. Jumping J off a rank. Did she say giant licorice or salt? Oh, she's a case, all right. Now, shut up. We might be getting somewhere. Does she mean the square ones in black and white layers? Pardon? Alternate layers of licorice and white cream. Ah, what a strange and wonderful universe we inhabit. I think I see daylight, Frogman. Ah, oh, Sunday in the country. <laughs> Sniff that. They've just been spreading fertiliser on the fields. Yes, sir, I noticed. Well, here we go. Oh, look at that doorbell. What a lovely touch. A bit twee, isn't it? No, Frogman. It's a stroke of genius. Now, eat nicely and say thank you for your bread and honey. 
Ah, just in time. Kettle coming to the boil. Hello there. Uh, wife couldn't make it. Oh. I've brought Frogman instead. Oh, uh, uh, Miss Miz and Peter called Fred are coming along too. Uh, Peter and Angela? If they don't get lost. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what a lovely house. Idyllic. Well, uh, come straight through to the back garden. Uh, I've been putting in the bedding out this way. Uh, more tea for you, Cockfoster. Oh, Char. My wife will kick herself for missing this. Mmm. Scrumptious honey, Frogman. <laughs> Fabulous. How many wickets do you take yesterday, Doctor? Uh, only a couple. They brought me on to mop up the tail enders. Yeah, it's too early in the season for real sustained spin. Wait till August. Yeah. I was leaping through wisdom <sighs> yesterday, trying to find a match when I last saw a bowling action like yours. Found it in the end. A minor counties match, Staffordshire versus Devon, 18 years ago, would you believe? Happened to be on holiday at the time, Timmouth. Glorious fortnight. This left-hander ran through the first Devon innings like a stream of tap water. Nine for 49. Skipper of the team. Name of Henry Pluck. <coughs> Never knew what became of him, but he was a pure delight. He did teach the torches to burn bright. More tea, Frogman. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Now what happened in the second innings? He got a bit too clever. A bit too ambitious. Started lofting them up at the openers and got smashed all over the shop. Nobody could take him off. He was the skipper, see? Three overs, no wickets for 77 runs. Excess of ingenuity. Devious beggar. It always gets punished in my experience of cricket. While sipping this very good mint tea, I've been watching those bees round those eyes. Oh, yes? There are those... Three eyes. But the bees are only going in and out of two of them, giving the middle eye a wide berth. Now, look at that one. Did you see? He went for the middle eye in a lazy old way, then suddenly stopped in midair as if dumbfounded, then zigzagged off as if you'd slapped him across the chops. Now, what's the reason for that? The Queen is dead. Oh, the palace is empty. Do you mind if I inspect this empty palace? Go ahead, but, but there's nothing to see. Come on, Frogman. Improve your knowledge of ichthyology. That's fish, sir. What's fish? Ichthyology. Uh, I was just testing you. OK, you take that side and I'll take this. Now, lift. There. Cool. Will you take a look at this? Mr. Victrola, I presume. Well, am I right, Frogman? I never met the gent. This is him, sir. And where's Dobell, Doctor? Under the bed in outs. Do you mind if we move inside so I can ask you some questions? Cool. Lovely drawing room, Doctor. What does it measure, just for interest's sake? I can't recall offhand. And, uh, what would this be? There's a strong resemblance to a giant licorice all sort. Notice that, Frogman? Yeah. One of the square sort in black and white layers. Cassette player. Am I correct, Doctor? Mind if I wind back and play it? See how it was done, Frogman? Oh, yes. He took it into the red telephone box and played it down my ear hole. He was outside Victrola's house all the time. He came up the path first, led our tyre down and pinched the spare. Then he rang up from the red telephone box, spoke to Dobell first, told him to hand the phone to me and then come outside. Tempted him with a bit more blackmail payout, eh, Doc, to follow the 15,000? Then he played the doorbell to me and made out he was at home. Told me he was going to answer the door. What he actually opened was his car door and slid in and finished off poor fat Eddie Dobell. Then, back to me on the blower and says he's found Dobell's nut and will I rush over. We tried a rush, but we've got a flat tyre. He's got a 25 minute start. Time to do all he likes. Oh, it was sweet work, Henry Pluck. Worthy of an England cap and blazer. All clear, Frogman? 
But <laughs> Victrola, he was seen, I mean, after he was dead, at the ambassador, then by Angela. In Shakespeare's time, they put traitors' heads on a pike and stuck them up smiling on Tower Bridge. Correct, Doc? I believe it was London Bridge. Ah, yeah, I'll stand corrected. A pony has four legs and yet still might stumble. As I did over ichthyology, too. Must be getting old. Howsomever, why do in Victrola, Doctor? Dobell told him about my past. Persistent nuisance in public toilets. I was on remand with Dobell years ago. He had a good memory for faces. I led such a lovely life up here till he came along. Cricket, bees, flowers. Peter called Fred? Yes, Peter called Fred. Dobell asked for money, and when I didn't pay... He squealed to Victrola, silly sausage. Why couldn't he be content with Gustav Mahler? You pleaded with Victrola to forgive and forget, as one lawbreaker to another. He, being a whited sepulchre, said no, and you, very understandably, sliced off his loaf. That about it? Yes, thereabouts. Well, you threw me up some tricky ones, but I've been and gone and sent you over the boundary ropes. Take him away, Frogman. Sir, uh, where to? Take him in. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Aren't you coming, sir? Uh, no, you two run along. I'll tell you a while. Oh, Peter and Angela never turned up, sir. Oh, I must have got lost. Or perhaps I forgot to invite them. <laughs> Are you sure you're not coming? No, no, I'll linger a while. Charming room. Ah, let's have some air in here. <clears throat> Absolutely charming. Here I am where I ought to be. Now then. One, two, three. The Red Telephone Box was written by Ken Whitmore. It starred Bob Grant as Chief Inspector Raymond Cockfoster. Detective Sergeant Frogman was Christian Rodsker. Benjamin Doble was John Hollis. Mrs. Victrola, Patricia England. Dr. Lamb, Ronald Herdman. Peter Royal, Freitag Fontaine. Angela Victrola, Dorcas Morgan. And Belinda Ruby was played by Sally Edwards. The director was Alfred Bradley. <laughs> We present John Moffat, Jeremy Clyde, and Madeline Smith in Agatha Christie's Murder on the Links. Damnation. Oh, I say. Oh, dear. Did I shock you? Oh, no, not in the least. I'm so sorry about my language. Most unladylike and all that. But I've lost my sister. Really? That's most unfortunate. He disapproves. He disapproves of my unladylike language, of me, of my sister, which is most unfair because you haven't even seen her. Well, now, look here. Say no more. Nobody loves me. I am <laughs> crushed. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you couldn't be such a mutt as you looked. Oh, Not that I'm against a little dignified disapproval, and I like a man who can still be shocked in this day and age. You see, my sister and I are in the theatre. You're an actress? Well, I wouldn't go that far. We've got a sort of song and dance act with a bit of comic patter thrown in. It's quite a good idea, and it does get them every time. Somehow they don't expect people to be able to dance and speak. She was enchanting. A curious mixture of child and woman. Though perfectly worldly wise, there was yet something oddly ingenuous in her single-minded determination. We're going to make money, I'm sure of it. If only she hadn't missed the bloody train. Oh dear, <laughs> go again. <laughs> it was a day in early June. I had been transacting some business in Paris and was returning by the morning train to London. So what do you do? I'm a sort of private secretary to an MP. <gasps> Important. I'm distinguished.
distinctly impressed. Oh, that's really awfully little to do. Usually a couple of hours a day sees me through. I, it's pretty dull, too. I don't know what I should do if I hadn't something to fall back on. Your etchings? <laughs> no. I share rooms with a very interesting man. He's Belgium. He's set up as a private detective in London, now that he's retired from the police. Sometimes he lets me help him out. I just adore crime. I go to all the mysteries of the movies, and when there's a murder on, I simply devour the papers. The miles flew by. We were so absorbed in one another that we were in Calais before we realised it. Goodbye, and I'll mind my language in future. Oh, but surely you'll let me look after you on the boat. Oh, I may not be on it. I've got to find out where that sister of mine has got to. But we're going to meet again, surely. Aren't you even going to tell me your name? Cinderella. Ah, oh, Hastings, you are the eternal romantic. You see a girl on the train, you talk to her for a couple of hours, and you do not even know her name. Mon ami, you restore my faith in the absurdity of the human race. And now tell me, what is in the morning post? Um, two bills, a letter from the Boy Scouts. Ah, no doubt they wish me to deliver a lecture. And this, uh, postmarked, Melanville sur mer Oh, let me see. Well, that's somewhere between Calais and Boulogne, isn't it? Listen to this. Dear Monsieur Poirot, I am in need of the services of a private detective. On account of a secret I possess, I go in daily fear of my life. I am convinced that the danger is imminent, and therefore beg that you lose no time in crossing to France. I will send a car to meet you at Calais if you will wire me when you are arriving. I shall probably need your services for a considerable period of time, as it may be necessary for you to go to Santiago. Oh. P.T. Renault. And there is a postscript. For God's sake, come. You'll go, of course. Of course. There's no time to lose. The Continental Express leaves Victoria at 11. You will accompany me? Oh, but, Poirot, I've only oh, just... Oh, come. After all, who will ever notice your absence? Who is this chap, anyway? A well-known South American millionaire. Come, let us pack. At Calais, there was no... Just... But Poirot did not seem unduly put out and promptly hired one. A little way outside Melanville, a girl with the figure of a young goddess showed us the rough, narrow road that led to the Renault house, the Villa Genevieve. What did I tell you, Hastings? The eternal romantic. But didn't you think she was beautiful? Oh, mon ami, two people rarely see the same thing. You, for instance, saw a goddess, while I... What did you see? I saw only a girl with anxious eyes. Something's wrong. There are police everywhere. What's happening? You can't go any further, monsieur. But we have to see Monsieur Renault. This is his villa, isn't it? Yes, monsieur, it is his villa. But I'm afraid that Monsieur Renault was found dead this morning. Do you mean he was murdered? I cannot answer any questions, monsieur. Very well. Will you have the goodness to see that... This is taken to the commissary at once. Uh, what is his name? Inspector Bex. My dear Monsieur Poirot, your arrival is most opportune. You have information to give which may assist us? Possibly you know it already. Were you aware that I had been sent for by the dead man? What? It seems he knew an attempt was to be made on his life. He sent for you? Hmm. Mm. Well, that upsets our theories considerably. Uh, let me take you to the examining magistrate. He's in the salon. Most extraordinary. But what is this secret he mentions? What a pity he wasn't more explicit. We're much indebted to you, Monsieur Poirot. I hope you will do us the honor of assisting us in our investigation. I did not arrive in time to prevent my client's death. But I feel myself bound in honor to discover the assassin. I am sure that Madame Renault will wish to retain your services. And I am sure Monsieur Giraud of the Sûreté, whom we expect at any moment, will be grateful for your assistance. And Monsieur Bex, perhaps you will be so good as to give Monsieur Poirot an outline of the case. The first sign that something was wrong was early this morning, when Francoise, an old servant, found that the front door was open. She thought that her master had gone out for a stroll. A little while later, Leonie, the young maid, went to call her mistress and found her gagged and bound, and almost at the same moment, 
News was brought that Monsieur Renault's body had been discovered. He'd been stabbed in the back. Where was the body found? Well, that is one of the most extraordinary features of the case. The body was lying face downwards in an open grave, just a few yards outside the villa grounds. And how long had he been dead? According to Dr. Durand, he died sometime between midnight and 3 a.m. And Madame Renault's evidence narrows the time to after 2 a.m., Death must have been instantaneous and naturally could not have been self-inflicted. What did she tell you? Uh, we've not been able to question her. She's still under sedation. Uh, what have you gathered from the other people who live in the house? Well, the chauffeur is on holiday and Monsieur Renault's son Jacques is away. Which leaves us with the two women servants. I was about to interview them when you arrived. I hope you will do me the honour of being present at my interrogation. Francoise Arichet. You have been in service at the Villa Genevieve for a long time. I was here for 11 years with the old countess, and when the villa was sold, I agreed to stay on with it. Uh, now, I understand that when you came down this morning, you found the front door was open. Was that right? Yes, that's right. I remember that I heard him lock up last night after she left, and... Uh, uh, just a moment. After who had left? The lady who came to see him. And who was she? Well, how should I know? Well, I'm sure you know very well who she was, and... And you're obliged to tell the police. Who was she? I never thought I'd be mixed up with the police. Very well, I'll tell you. It was Madame Dubray. She often comes round in the evenings. Madame Dubray from the Villa Marguerite? That's the place, just down the road. Yes, so you're saying that Monsieur Renault and Madame Dubray were... Well, I'm not saying anything. She's not so young any longer, but I've seen the way men look at her when she goes down the street. And just lately... She's had more money to spend. Everyone's noticed. And it. can you tell us what time Monsieur Renault let her out? About 25 minutes past 10. Do you know what time he went to bed? I heard him come up about 10 minutes after we did. The stairs creak so that you can hear anyone going up and down. Thank you, Francoise. That will be all. Leonie Hollande. Now, mademoiselle, I understand that it was you who admitted Madame Dobreuil last night. Not last night, monsieur. The night before. But Francoise has just told us that Madame Dobreuil was here last night. No, monsieur. A lady did come to see Monsieur Renault last night, but it was not Madame Dobreuil. This lady was much younger. And there is one other thing. And what is that? I think she was English. At least she was speaking to Monsieur Renault in English, and he was speaking English as well. When he opened the door to let her out, he said, Yes, but for God's sake, go now. Thank you, mademoiselle. Is that all? For the present. But this is most interesting. Show Monsieur Poirot the letter. The letter? The letter we found in Renault's overcoat. Ah. It was written in English and was obviously from a woman. Mm. Thank you, Monsieur Bex. Perhaps you would uh, care to read it to us, Hastings? Um, my dearest, why have you not written for so long? You do love me still, don't you? I can't live without you. Sometimes I fancy another woman is coming between us. If that is so, take care. I'd as soon kill you as lose you to another woman. I mean it. How can I convince you how much I love you? Your own adoring Bella. And what do you make of it, monsieur? It would seem to offer a very simple explanation for the murder... But Crime Passionnel does not really answer to the facts of the case. It does not account for the masked men or for Renault's letter to you. Though there is one other thing. And what is that? The dead man's will. Take a look. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. Everything left unconditionally to his beloved wife, Eloise. Simply drawn up at perfectly legal. Uh, perhaps you have not noticed... The date? Yes, I noticed it. A fortnight ago. Possibly it marks his first intimation of danger. Oh, don't you think it's a little hard on his son? It leaves him entirely dependent on his mother, and if she were to marry again... Oh, man is a vain animal. Doubtless Monsieur Renault was certain that his wife would never marry again. Or perhaps he thought it would be wiser to leave all the money in his wife's hands. The sons of rich men are notoriously wild. Oh, it may be as you say. And now... I am sure you would like to visit the scene of the crime. Hmm? Monsieur Bex will show you where the body was found. This way, gentlemen. Uh, uh, just a moment, if you please. Uh, that room there, is, uh, is that Monsieur Renault's study? You would like to see it? Hmm. 
Thank you. Ah, Monsieur Renault was evidently a man of taste and order. Everything in its place, except for the hearth rug. It is crooked. Ah, what have you found? A scrap of paper. In France, as in England, the domestics omit to sweep under mats. Do you see what it is? A fragment of a check. It appears to be made out to someone named Duby. And if I am not mistaken, the handwriting is that of Monsieur Renault. Oh, I really cannot imagine how I came to overlook this. Uh, Renault's checkbook was on his desk. I remember noting that, but the last counterfoil is blank. The murdered man's body lay in a shed at the back of the house. Monsieur Renault looked to be about 50 years of age. His skin was deeply bronzed. On his face was an expression of absolute amazement and terror. Have you any idea with what weapon the crime was committed? It was left in the wound. Here it is. Yeah, it looks like a paper knife. Ah, it is remarkably sharp. A nice little tool for murder. No fingerprints? None. Monsieur? Yes? What is it? Madame is much recovered and ready to receive the examining magistrate. Well, tell Monsieur Ote and say that we will come at once. Very good, Monsieur. Monsieur Renaud wore only underclothes under his overcoat? Yes. Monsieur Ote thinks that is rather a curious point. Hmm. And his overcoat is unusually long. Take care. The stairs are rather worn. And noisy, too. They creak feet to wake the dead. The servants' quarters are along there. Come in. Pray be seated, gentlemen. I hope that it will not distress you too much to tell us what happened last night. Not in the least. I know that you must act swiftly if you're to catch my husband's murderers. It might tire you less if I were to ask you questions. I, would... I felt a hand being pressed over my mouth. The light was turned on. There were two men in the room. Can you describe them? I could see very little of their faces. They were masked. One was very tall and had a long black beard. The other was shorter and stout and... His beard was red. He was the one who was holding me. He forced a gag into my mouth and then bound up my hands and feet. And what about your husband? They forced him into the room next door. I could hear them talking in Spanish. They said something about a secret. They wanted to know where it was hidden. And then they hurried my husband out of the room. He was only half-dressed. The tall man said, One sound and you're a dead man. I must have fainted after that. And do you have any idea for what they were searching? None, whatever. Tell me, madame, had your husband shown any sign of anxiety before the attack? He seemed distracted, and he wouldn't tell me what was wrong. Were you aware that he had called in the services of a detective? A detective? Yes, this gentleman, Monsieur Hercule Poirot, madame. I had no idea of this. I see. What time was the crime committed? I remember hearing the clock on the mantelpiece strike two. Ah, there's a watch on the floor. It looks as if one of the men trod on it. It's mine. It must have fallen off the dressing table. But it says seven o'clock. Uh, let me see. Hmm. The glass is broken, but it is still going. But it's only five o'clock now. It is of no importance. Are you aware that your husband had a visitor last night? No. Who was it? A lady. Indeed. Forgive me, madame, but do you recognize this? Yes. That's my little paper knife. But was that... The... Yes, madame. Your husband was killed with this weapon. They took it from my dressing table. It was a present from my son. It was made from a streamline airplane wire. He was in the Air Force during the war. Which brings us to another matter. Where is your son now? He's on his way to Buenos Aires. 
My husband telegraphed him last night to tell him to go there straight away. And do you know why? I have no idea. He was going overland from there to Santiago. Santiago. Everything seems to bring us back to Santiago. Um, pardon, madame, but uh, may I examine your wrists? If you wish, monsieur. Hmm. They must cause you great pain. There was a look of disappointment in his eyes. The magistrate led Madame Renault down the stairs and out to the shed to identify the body. Are you ready, madame? Yes, monsieur. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my beloved. Oh, madame. Hastings, I am an imbecile. If ever there was love and grief in a woman's voice, I heard it then. I must start again. Beck set off for the scene of the crime, but Poirot stopped by the flower beds on either side of the steps leading up to the front door. The murderer could easily have climbed up to the bedroom by that tree on the left. But they could not have done so without leaving footsteps in the flower bed. You are right. And there is not the least sign. But in the other flower bed, there are plenty of footprints. I think you'll find they are those of the gardener. Hmm. So you think they are of no importance? Not the least. Bex led us along a path bordered by a shrubbery on either side. Suddenly we emerged onto a wide stretch of open downs with a distant view of the sea. It was a golf course. The links will not be opened until next month. It was the men who were working on them who discovered the body this morning. In that pit over there. But there's someone there now. Uh, my men have had strict orders to allow no one to interfere. I am not exactly no one, Monsieur Bex. And I have every right. Uh, my dear Monsieur Giro. Uh, gentlemen, this is Monsieur Giro of the Sûreté. The famous detective from Paris was already familiar to me by name. There was a distinct arrogance in his manner which showed he was fully alive to his own importance. Poirot, I know you by name. You cut quite a figure in the old days, didn't you? Crimes do not change much over the years. The police should have been prevented from trampling all over the place. But the vital evidence is still there. The external signs, that is what you seek? Of course. You see that spade? Mm -hmm. It was used to dig the grave. And those gloves at your feet? Mm -hmm. Reno's spade and Reno's gloves. The man was stabbed with his own dagger. His own gloves held his own spade with which his grave was dug. And uh, this piece of lead piping, did this belong to the murdered man? It may have been lying around for weeks. Anyway, it doesn't interest me. It interests me. But no matter. Uh, Monsieur Bex, what is the meaning of this white line that extends all the way around the grave? Is it the work of your men? Uh, no, Monsieur Poirot. It is part of the work on the golf course. It is the outline of a bunker. But what a curious place to bury a body. Hmm? When the men began to dig up the ground, all would be discovered. Exactly. Which proves that the murderers were strangers to the place. Unless, of course, they wanted the body to be discovered. <laughs> Which is clearly absurd, is it not? I must admit I was beginning to worry that Poirot was losing his grip. He continued to mutter on to himself about the lead piping and the broken wristwatch. He proved that the footprints in the flower bed were made by the gardener's boots, and he did not seem in the least impressed by Monsieur Ote's discovery that Madame de Broglie had paid 200,000 francs into her bank account in the last six weeks. It is getting late, but I think we should pay her a visit. It is possible that he may have told her the secret he did not confide to his wife. We walked through the cool of the evening to the Villa Marguerite. She's lived here for many years. Very quiet, very unobtrusive. And then I realized that the villa was the home of the beautiful girl with the figure of a goddess. Monsieur, what do you want? She was more beautiful than I'd remembered, but deathly white and very ill at ease. She led us through to her mother's room. 
But what possible help can I be to you? We have reason to believe, madame, that you were an intimate friend of Monsieur Renault. What are you saying? That you frequently visited his villa in the evening, is that so? I deny your right to ask me such a question. Madame, we are investigating a murder. I had nothing to do with the murder. We do not say that for a moment. But you knew the dead man well. Did he ever talk about any danger that threatened him? Never. Nor of any enemies he may have made in South America. He said nothing. I really cannot see why you should come to me. Cannot his wife tell you what you want to know? Sometimes, madame, a man tells his mistress what he does not always tell his wife. Have the goodness to leave my house, monsieur. We left the Villa Marguerite like a shamefaced pack of schoolboys. Ote and Bex went back to the scene of the crime. Poirot and I set off towards the Hotel des Bains in Melanville, where we had booked rooms. The French police system is marvellous. The information they possess about everyone's life... Monsieur! Ah, Monsieur. I beg your pardon. I should not do this, I know. You must not tell my mother. Of course not, Mademoiselle. Is it true that you are the detective Monsieur Renault called in before he died? Yes, it is quite true. But how did you learn it? Francoise told our maid. Ah. Well, Mademoiselle, what is it you want to know? Is anyone suspected of the crime? Why do you want to know? Monsieur Renault was always very kind to me. It is natural that I should be interested. I see. Well, mademoiselle, suspicion at present is hovering around two persons. Two? Their names are unknown, but they are presumed to be Chileans from Santiago. And now you see what comes of being young and beautiful. I have betrayed professional secrets for you. Come, Hastings, we must be getting back to our hotel. Goodbye. Mademoiselle. Goodbye, monsieur, and thank you. <sighs> Nowhere to hang my clothes. No one to polish my shoes. You, you are not listening to me, Hastings. What was that? Ah. Uh, I have seen that look on your face before. Do not set your heart on Mademoiselle Dobroy. She is not for you. She has the face of an angel. Mm. Some of the greatest criminals I have known had the faces of angels. A malformation of the little grey cells may coincide quite easily with the face of a Madonna. You can't suspect that poor innocent girl. If only I could remember where I had seen that face. Mademoiselle Mart? No, 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 no. Her mother's. It was a long time ago when I was still with the police in Belgium. I have never actually seen her before, but I have seen her picture, and I rather fancy... Well, I may be mistaken, but I fancy it was a murder case. We were up at the villa early next morning. Poirot started to draw out the young maid, Leonie, on the subject of a quarrel she had overheard between Monsieur Renault and his son. I was dusting the salon, and I saw him pass, and his face was white, white with two burning spots of red. I had a mind to take another look at the scene of the crime. I fought my way through the shrubbery and found myself on the links, some hundred yards away from where the murder had been committed. A young lady was standing with her back to me, gazing out towards the sea. She turned and looked at me. What are you doing here? Cinderella. When I last saw you the day before yesterday, you were going home to England like a good little boy. Oh. When I last saw you, you were trotting home with your sister like a good little girl. How is your sister? How kind of you to ask. She's quite well, thank you. She is here with you? She remained in town. I don't believe you've got a sister. What are you doing here, anyway? Resting, I suppose you've heard of the term. And what are you doing here? You remember that I told you I had a great friend who was a detective? I remember. And perhaps you've heard of this murder at the Villa Marguerite. You don't mean to say you're on that. As a matter of fact, I am. Oh, then you must take me to see everything. How do you mean? The place where it happened and the murder weapon and any fingerprints or interesting things like that. I've never had a chance of being right in on a murder like this. Oh, please. I didn't need much persuasion. I told her most of what I knew. 
I showed her where the body had been discovered. I even got the key of the little shed and showed her the body itself. Oh, it's horrible. And to think that a few hours ago he was still alive. Do they know how he was killed? He was killed with a dagger. It's in this glass jar here. Oh! Let's get you out of here. It's been too much for you. No. I'll be all right. Get me some water quickly. I rushed off to the house. Fortunately, none of the servants was about, and I was able to secure a glass of water unobserved and add a few drops of brandy from my pocket flask. Oh, thanks. Oh, that's better. Why did you let me go in there? Because you insisted. It was your idea. I suppose it was. Well, I'd better be off. Uh, but you can't go just like that. You're, you're not well. Nonsense. I'm quite all right now. Uh, won't you let me come with you? There is nothing wrong with me, I assure you. You've been very kind. I hope you won't get into trouble for showing me things. Oh, don't give it a second thought, but, but you haven't told me your address. Oh, I'm staying at the Hotel de Far. It's a little place, but quite good. Come and look me up tomorrow. It wasn't until I got back to the villa that I realised I still didn't know her name. I found Poirot in the drawing room doing his best to preserve his patience with the appalling Giro. Monsieur Ote preserved an aloof silence. What do you see there? A cigarette end and a match. And what does that tell you? It tells me nothing. Obviously, you haven't made a study of these things. Oh. It is no ordinary match. It comes from South America. Luckily, it was unlit. Otherwise, I might not have recognized it. Evidently, one of the assassins threw away his cigarette and lit another, spilling one match out of the box as he did so. And the other match? Which match? The one he did light his cigarette with? You have found that also? It is of no importance. Hmm. The cigarette end is enough. It is a South American cigarette with licorice pectoral paper. But it is only four years since Monsieur Renault returned from South America. Might not the cigarette and match belong to him? No. I have already searched among the effects of Monsieur Renault. His cigarettes were quite different. Uh, tell me, Monsieur Giraud, does nothing strike you as familiar about this case? Is there nothing it reminds you of? No, I can't say offhand. I don't think so. Nevertheless, a crime almost precisely similar has been committed before. When and where? Ah. That, unfortunately, I can't for the moment remember, but I shall do so. I hoped you might be able to assist me. There have been many affairs of masked men. A ah, man is an unoriginal animal. If he commits a crime, any other crime he commits will resemble it closely. The English murderer who disposed of his wives by drowning them in their baths is a case in point. Where is all this getting us? When you have two crimes, precisely similar in design and execution, you find the same brain behind them both. I am looking for that brain, Monsieur Giraud, and I shall find it. Oh, I'm sorry, Monsieur, but he insisted... Forgive me for disturbing you. Who the devil are you? What do you mean by bursting into the room? I suspect he has every right to do so. You are Jacques Renaud, isn't that so? That is correct. So you did not sail on the Anzora? The ship was delayed for 24 hours by engine trouble. I happened to buy an evening paper and saw the report of my father's death. Sit down, Monsieur Renaud. It must have been a terrible shock for you to learn the news as you did. I hope you will not feel that we are too insensitive. If I'm we ask. at your disposal. Ask me any questions you please. I understand that the journey was undertaken at your father's request. That is so. Here's the telegram he sent. Proceed immediately, Cherbourg and Zora, sailing tonight, Buenos Aires. Ultimate destination, Santiago. Further instructions await you at Buenos Aires. You have been a good deal in South America, I think. I was there as a child, but I was educated in England, and when the war came, I served in the Royal Flying Corps. If you will permit, I would like to put a question to Monsieur Reynaud. By all means, if you wish. Were you on good terms with your father? Certainly I was. So there is no truth in the assertion that you had a violent quarrel with him on the eve of your departure for Paris? We did have an argument. And did you say something like, when you are dead, I can do as I please? 
I must request an answer. I dare say I said that. I was very angry. And what was the subject of your quarrel? I decline to answer that. Monsieur Renault, it is not permitted to trifle with the law. I will inform you, if you like, monsieur. You know Poirot? Certainly I do. The subject of the quarrel was Mademoiselle Marthe d'Aubray. How the devil do you know that? <laughs> is that so, monsieur? Yes, it is. I love Mademoiselle d'Aubray, and I wish to marry her. When I informed my father of the fact, he flew at once into a violent rage. Well, naturally, I couldn't stand having the girl I love insulted, and I, too, lost my temper and said what I said. You were aware, then, of the terms of your father's will? I knew he'd left half his fortune to me and the other half to my mother to come to me after her death. Do you recall an unusual present you gave to your mother, a, a paper knife? The one I made from aeroplane wire. It was the weapon which killed your father. May I see it? Your mother has already identified it, but, but of course you shall see it. If I might trouble you, Monsieur Beck? Certainly. I will fetch it immediately. In the meantime, let me put another question to you. Are you acquainted with the name of Duveen? Duveen? Bella Duveen. It means nothing to me. Perhaps you would care to read this letter. We found it in your father's overcoat. Can you give us any clue as to the identity of the writer? I've no idea whatsoever. Uh, does my mother? As yet, no. Monsieur le juge. Yes, what is it? The dagger has gone. What do you mean? But I saw it this morning. You saw it, Captain Hastings? There was nothing for it but to make a clean breast of it. Under the circumstances, they were quite remarkably forbearing. Giro even congratulated me on providing him with a vital clue. But it was Poirot's opinion that I dreaded. He seemed remarkably unconcerned and was more interested in measuring the length of Jack Renault's overcoat. Hmm. Most satisfying. What were you hoping to learn by measuring it? To see how long it was. Oh, tell me, my friend, what are your thoughts about the case? To tell you the truth, I'm very worried about Madame Renault. There's something about her that doesn't quite ring true. You are right. From the beginning, I have been sure that she was keeping something back. At first, I suspected her, if not of inspiring, at least of conniving at the crime. Why? By the new will, she is the only person to benefit from her husband's death. You may have noticed that I took an early opportunity of examining her wrists. Mm -hmm. I wished to see whether there was any possibility she had bound herself. And had she? The cords had been drawn so tight as to cut into the flesh. There was no possibility she could have done it. But still there was something familiar about the story of the masked men and the secret. And there was the little matter of the wristwatch. What about it? Now, it is time to employ the little grey cells, my friend. When did the crime take place? Oh, Madame Renault said she heard the clock strike two while the men were in the room. And she was lying. The crime took place at least two hours earlier. For some reason, it was imperative that it should appear to have taken place later than it actually did. You have heard of a smashed watch recording the exact hour of the crime? Oh, yes, but the watch... The glass was broken, but the mechanism of the watch kept going, which drew my attention to two important points. First, that Madame Renault was lying. Second, that there must be some vital reason for the postponement of the crime. And that reason may have been that the last train left Merlinville at 17 minutes past 12. So that if the crime appeared to have taken place two hours later, anyone leaving by that train would have an unimpeachable alibi. Exactly. Well, so we must inquire at the station. They can't have failed to notice two foreigners who left by that train. Oh, oh, oh my friend. Surely you do not believe all that rigmarole about the masked men? But Renard's letter, the secret, and Santiago... I'll take my word for it. Santiago is a red herring. The danger that threatened him was near at hand in France. Well, then, what really happened? Only one person could tell us that. Madame Renault. As I said, I suspected her at first, but... What made you change your mind? Her spontaneous grief at the sight of her husband's body. I could swear that was genuine. And she actually fainted. Oh, it was no fake. Tell me, Hastings, what is the explanation of the open door? I suppose it was simply an oversight. There is something about it which, for the moment, I cannot fathom. But one thing I am fairly certain of. They left by the window. 
But there were no footprints in the flower bed underneath. No, and there ought to have been. In the other bed, there were plentiful impressions of the gardener's big hobnail boots. In the other, none. Someone had smoothed over the surface with a rake. But I must be going. The train to Paris leaves at 2.25. Why are you going to Paris? To look for the murderer of Monsieur Renault. I shan't be away long. Stay here and cultivate the society of Jacques Renault. Which reminds me, how did you know about him and Marthe de Broy? Oh, my friend, I know human nature. Throw together a boy like young Renault and a beautiful girl like Mademoiselle Marthe, and the result is almost inevitable. And remember, she has anxious eyes. What do you mean by that? I fancy, my friend, that we shall see before long. But I must be on my way. I'll come and see you all. You'll do nothing of the sort. I forbid it. There was nothing I could say to that, so I let him go. I strolled down to the beach in the hope that Cinderella might be disporting herself in some wonderful costume. But there was no sign of her. So I decided to try the Hotel du Far. I'm sorry, but there's no such lady staying here. But the lady told me herself. She must have made a mistake. There's been another gentleman here inquiring for her. He described her in just the same way. What was he like? He was a small, plump gentleman, very neat, with a stiff moustache. So that was why he refused to let me accompany him to the station. I felt angry and betrayed. Why did he have to meddle in everything? I went to bed that night in a distinctly bad humour. The following morning was heavy and overcast, and an unwelcome surprise awaited me at the Villa Genevieve. It is terrible. There is a curse upon the house. They should send for Monsieur le Curé to bring some holy water. Never will I sleep another night under this roof. But what has happened? Have you not heard? There's been another murder. Who has been killed? How should I know? He is a stranger. They found him up there in the shed, not a hundred yards from where they found poor Monsieur Renault. And that is not all. He was stabbed with the same dagger. I am expecting the doctor at any moment, although we hardly need him. When was it done? Last night? I don't lay down the law on medical evidence, but the man's been dead well over 12 hours. When did you say you last saw that dagger? About ten o'clock yesterday morning. Then it was probably not long after that. The body was dragged in here after the killing by two people. They've been careful to obliterate their tracks, but I can see well enough the unmistakable prints of a woman's shoe. Uh, she is here, monsieur. Show her in. Okay. Madame Renault, this is the man. Do you know him? No. I have never seen him in my life. You do not recognize him as one of your assailants? No. I do not think so. Thank you, madame. And that is all. The doctor is here. Good morning, Monsieur Charol. At last. We will leave you to get on with your work. Come, Mr. Hastings. There's something I want to show you. Just take a look at this. A woman's hair. It was wrapped round the handle of the dagger. A long black hair. Does it suggest anything to you? Well, I was scarcely... It suggests to me Madame de Breuil. But there will be time enough to go into that. I shall confront her and her daughter with the body. But there is something else. Did you look at the victim's hands? No, I can't say that I did. The nails were broken and dirty. And the skin was hard. They were not the hands of a gentleman. But he was dressed as one. And none of his clothing is marked. Monsieur Giraud. Well, Doctor, was I right? The man was killed shortly after ten yesterday. Monsieur Giraud, that man has been dead for at least 48 hours and probably longer. The whole thing was utterly fantastic. And then a telegram arrived from Poirot. His train would arrive at Melanville at 12.28. And needless to say, it was late. It occurred to me that I might pass the time by asking a few questions as to who had left by train on the night of the murder. No, monsieur, there were no foreigners. Very few people took the train. I would certainly have noticed. Did young Monsieur Renault leave by that train? Oh, no, monsieur. 
What possible reason could he have for arriving and departing within half an hour? You mean that he arrived at Melanville that evening? By the last train, 11.40. Ah, mon cher ami, how good of you to come and meet me. Oh, I thought that was what you expected. Now, I have succeeded beyond all expectations. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Have you heard the latest here? No, how could I possibly hear anything? We must go up to the villa at once. Hmm? There has been another murder. Another murder? Ah, oh, then all my ideas are wrong. I have failed. It demolishes my theory. It ruins everything. Oh, no, no, no. It is impossible. I cannot be wrong. Unless... Unless what? Unless the victim is a man of middle age... His body was found in the locked shed near the scene of the crime and had been dead at least 48 hours. Why, oh, you're pulling my leg. You've heard all about it already. Would I do such a thing? No, I assure you that I have heard nothing whatsoever. Well, then how on earth can you know that? I was right then. Ha <laughs> ha. The little grey cells, they told me. Come, let us cut across the golf links. I want to take a look at the body. Why are you so interested in a bundle of rags? What do you make of them? Old clothes of the gardeners. If you say so. Uh, Dr. Durand. What is it? There is foam on the lips. You observed it? I didn't notice it, I must admit. But you observe it now? Oh, certainly. It is a very strange wound. It has not bled. Now, what do you think, Doctor? The dagger is slightly discolored, that is all. I agree, it is most abnormal. It is not abnormal at all. It is perfectly simple. The man was stabbed after he was dead. You noticed, of course, Monsieur Giraud. Certainly I noticed. Mm. But how was he killed, Poirot? He was not killed. He died. He died, if I am not much mistaken, of an epileptic fit. Poirot was the hero of the hour. But he was terribly concerned that his moustaches had grown limp in the heat of the railway journey, and we returned to the hotel. Ah, and just look at my tie. It is a disgrace. Um, could you pass me the pomade? Okay, here you are. Why did you go to Paris? To find this newspaper cutting. You recognize the photograph? Madame de Bruy. No, no. Not quite correct, my friend. She did not call herself by that name in those days. That is the notorious Madame Beroldi. Madame Beroldi? You remember the name? Wasn't she the one who was accused of murdering her husband? Just so. She was found in her bedroom, mm. bound hand and foot with her husband, dead beside her. And mm. there was some story about masked mm. Russians, but... Mm. Yes, that's just like... No, 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 no. no. Do, do not agitate me. The moustaches are at a critical point... And there were two other men in the case, a lawyer called George Connor, mm. who was supposed to have been her lover, and a rich American called... Um... Hiram P. Trapp. And she was supposed to have got Connor to murder her husband so that she would be free to marry the millionaire. Ah. And, and when Connor found that he had been used by her, he wrote to the prosecutor making a public confession. Confession. He was never found, and she somehow or other was acquitted. She swore that she had nothing to do with the planning of the crime that Connor had killed her husband out of love for her, and that the first she knew of it was when she saw Connor standing over her with the blood-stained knife in his hand. But didn't they prove she could easily have got out of her bonds? They did. But she was a very beautiful woman, and her address to the jury was a masterpiece. She had a small child, I remember. A little girl... Whatever became of her? She left to begin a new life in Paris. And nothing more was heard of her. I see everything now. What exactly do you see? But that it was Madame de Broy who murdered Renault. Why? Why should she murder Renault? Well, uh, because... Um... Uh, you see, we can find no shadow of a motive. She does not benefit by his death. Considered as a mistress or as a blackmailer, she stands to lose. You can't have murder without a motive. And there is something that you are forgetting. And what's that? It was not Madame Dubreuil who told us this tale of being tied up by masked men. It was Madame Renault. And so, 
we draw nearer to the truth, which is, as always, very curious and interesting. What else have you found out? I have discovered what Monsieur Renault sent for me to discover. And you know the murderer? I know one murderer. What do you mean? That we have here not one crime, but two. The first I have solved. The second, I must confess I am not sure. But I thought you said the man in the shed died a natural death. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Still, you do not understand. One may have a crime without a murderer, but for two crimes, it is essential to have two bodies. Um, enter. Monsieur Jacques, please come in. You got my little note? Yes, I did. I'm sorry to oblige you to come out here, but you will perhaps understand the atmosphere of the villa is not very congenial to me. Monsieur Giraud and I do not see eye to eye. I found by the sight of him. He's an arrogant idiot. Then may I ask a little favor of you? Well, certainly. Would you be so kind as to go to the railway station and take a train to the next station along the line, Abalak? Ask at the cloakroom where the two foreigners left a case there on the night of the murder. Will you do that? Well, certainly I will. There is a train in a quarter of an hour, and I must ask you not to return to the villa, as I have no wish for Giro to get an inkling of your errand. I'll go straight to the station. Yeah, uh, uh, just a moment. There is one other thing. Why did you not tell Monsieur Ote that you were in Merlinby on the night of the murder? Because I was not in Merlinby. I was in Cherbourg. But the staff at the railway station say you arrived by the 11.40 train. Did they? Are you accusing me of murdering my father? I should like an explanation. I came to see my fiancée, Mademoiselle de Bray. I was about to go away for a long time. I did not want the whole world to know about us. And did you see her? Yes. And afterwards? I found out missed the last train. I walked to Beauvais and got a car to take me to Cherbourg. A long walk at that hour of night. Well, thank you, Monsieur Jacques. And now, if you would be so kind as to carry out my little errand. Of course. Au revoir, Monsieur Poirot. Mm -hmm. What was all that about? Why are you sending him off to Abalak? Oh, come, Hastings. Surely it is obvious. Oh, you want to get him out of the way? Ah, your penetration is amazing. Now, let us go up to the Villa Genevieve. But we did not go straight there. Instead, Poirot decided that we should hang about outside the Villa Marguerite, hoping that Mademoiselle Mart might come into the garden. And, eventually, she appeared. Mademoiselle, a little word with you. What is it, Monsieur Poirot? You remember asking me if anyone were suspected of the crime? Yes, monsieur. You said they were looking for two Chileans. If you were to ask me that question again now, I should give you a different answer. Who then? Jacques Renault. But that's impossible. You know, of course, that he was here on the night of the murder. Yes, he told me. It was unwise of him to have tried to conceal the fact. Yes, but we cannot waste our time on regrets. He is innocent, and we must save him. Uh, Mademoiselle, is there something that you are keeping back that you could tell us? Yes, there is something, but I hardly know whether you will believe it. At any rate, tell us. On the morning of the day Monsieur Renault was killed, I was walking here in the garden when I heard a sound of men's voices quarrelling in the garden of the Villa Genevieve. I pushed aside the bushes and looked through. One of the men was Monsieur Renault, and the other man was a tramp, a dreadful creature in filthy rags. He was asking for money. At that moment, Maman called from the house, and I had to go. When the second corpse was found, Monsieur Giraud insisted I looked at it. I am almost sure that the tramp and that dead man are the same. But why did you not say so at the time? The body was dressed in gentleman's clothes. It was only afterwards Mark. that I... Where are you? Forgive me, I must go. Hmm. Well, let us go back to the Villa Hastings. Is she just trying to divert suspicion from her lover? It is a curious tale. 
but I believe it to be the truth. And she inadvertently gave us the truth on another point. She did not say that Jacques Renault had been with her on the night of the crime. She simply said, he told me. If he did not see her, then who did he see? The Villa Genevieve seemed deserted. Poirot led me swiftly to Jack Renault's room and very methodically started to search through the cupboards and the desk. What is it? A car's just driven up. It's, it's Giro with Jack Renault and two gendarmes. Oh, that stupid animal who could not wait. I shall not be able to replace the things in this drawer with the proper method. But ah, I have found what I wanted. Come. What is happening? Where are you taking my son? He is under arrest for the murder of his father. What? It's not true. It can't. Before anyone could get to her, she fell heavily down the stairs. Poirot was instantly at her side. She has cut her head badly, and I fancy there is slight concussion here. But she must make a statement. Then you will have to wait. She will probably be unconscious for at least a week. A doctor was sent for, and we left Madame Renault in the capable hands of Francoise. Giro went off with his captive. Poirot decided he wanted sea air. We will sit on this little mound and to review the case. Do you believe Jack is guilty? There is just a chance of it. But Giro, of course, has got it wrong. The gravest charge against Jacques Renault is known only to me. What is that? Now, if you would use your little grey cells and see the whole case as clearly as I do, you too would perceive it. Think, my friend. Arrange your ideas. Be methodical. Um... There is one thing. Well? There's someone we've forgotten. And who is that? George Connor. Excellent. Carry on. Well, he disappeared 20 years ago, but we've no reason to suppose he's dead. Proceed. Therefore, we will assume that he is alive. Perhaps. Or that he was alive until recently. Better. Let us presume that he's fallen on evil times. He's become a tramp. And quite by chance, he comes to Melanville. And there he finds the woman he never ceased to love. Ah, always the romantic. No, no, no. Let, let me go on. He finds that she has a new lover, Monsieur Renault. He lies in wait for him as he comes to meet his mistress and stabs him in the back. There's a terrible scene with Madame de Breuil and he suddenly falls down in an epileptic fit. Jacques Renault suddenly appears... Oh, no, no, and... no, 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 no. This is a tale for the cinema. It bears no sort of resemblance to everyday life. Well, I admit I haven't got into all the details, On but I... the contrary, you have ignored every one of them. Now, let us start from the basic fact of Georges Renault. It is possible that he contrived Madame Beroldi's story about being tied up by Russians all those years ago. Mm -hmm. It is equally possible that he contrived the tying up of Madame Renault. He is the most likely person to be behind the affair. Now, let us go through the case chronologically. You have a notebook and pencil? Yeah. Good, good. 23rd of May. Monsieur Renault quarrels with his son over the latter's wish to marry Marthe d'Aubray. Son leaves for Paris. 24th of May. Monsieur Renault alters his will, leaving entire control of his fortune in his wife's hands. 7th of June. Quarrel with Tramp in Garden. Letter written to Hercule Poirot imploring assistance. Telegram sent to Jacques Renault telling him to proceed to Buenos Aires. Chauffeur sent on holiday. Visit of a lady that evening. But... Who was she? The woman called Bella Duveen, his mistress. And how do we know that? By the letter found in his overcoat. But what makes you think that letter was written to him? Well, it was in the overcoat. Are you suggesting it was planted? I am suggesting it was not his overcoat. Huh? You remember that on examining the dead man's overcoat, I suggested that it was over long? I also measured the overcoat of Jacques Renault. It was short. So... When he flung out of the house for Paris after the row with his father, he took the wrong overcoat. So, the, the letter was written to Jack Renault. Exactly. So, now we know why Bella Duvin came to the villa that night, though whether she hoped to see Jack also, we do not know. She told Monsieur Renault she had a claim on Jack and showed him letters Jacques had written to her. 
the older man tried to buy her off by writing a check, which she tore up. In the end, he got rid of her and... You remember the words overheard by the maid, Leonie? Yes, yes, but for God's sake, go now. He was desperately anxious to get her out of the way. Time was slipping by, and for some reason, time was precious. Why should it be? That is what we must ask ourselves. Time was important. Do not forget the incident of the wristwatch. You always keep coming back to that. I, I don't see where all this is leading us. Why can't you simply tell me who killed Monsieur Renault? That is just what I am not sure of. That's typical. You ridicule all my ideas, but when it comes down Patience, to... Patience, my friend. Remember, it is two crimes we are investigating, for which, as I have pointed out, we have the necessary two bodies. Now, let me ask a question. Whom do we believe to have planned the crime? You've just told me. George Connor. And we know the crime to be a fake. And that Madame Renault is lying to protect someone. Perhaps her son, perhaps the man she loves. But if Connor planned the crime and she did it for the man she loved, then she loves George Connor. If you look at it like that... Who, then, is George Connor? The tramp. Have we any evidence to show that she loved the tramp? No. Now, ask yourself... Whom Madame Renault did love? Whom did she love so dearly that when she saw his dead body, she fell down in a faint? Her husband. Her husband. Or Georges Connaud. Whichever you like to call him. Oh, but that's impossible. How impossible? Because it would mean that Renault planned his own murder. Well, mon ami, that is exactly what he did do. How could any man in his right mind... There is one detail that perhaps escapes you. He did not intend to die. It is almost simple, really. Georges Connaud flies from Chastise to Canada. There, under an assumed name, he marries and goes to South America where he acquires a large fortune. Twenty years elapse, and he deems it safe to return to Europe. And ill fortune, or obscure justice, if you wish, takes him to Merlinville and to the one person in the whole of France who is capable of recognizing him, Madame Dobray. And she bleeds him heavily. Then the inevitable happens. Jacques Renault falls in love with Martha Dobray and determines to marry her. The life that Conneau has rebuilt as Renault is about to collapse like a house of cards. There is only one way of escape. Death. He must appear to die, in reality escaping to a foreign country where he will start again under yet another assumed name and where Madame Renault would eventually join him. But where were they going to get the body from? Oh, who knows? Chance played into their hands. A violent and abusive tramp finds his way into the garden. There is a struggle and the tramp falls down in a fit and dies. But he didn't look in the least like Georges Connor. Exactly. So the identification must rest solely on Madame Renault's evidence. The chauffeur and Jacques Renault are both got out of the way, and having heard of me as a rather obscure elderly detective, he wrote his appeal for help, knowing that when I arrived, the production of the letter would have a profound effect. So, they dressed the body in a suit of Renault's clothes, and Renault, or Conno, or whatever you call him, was going to shuffle off on the last train dressed in the tramp's clothes. So he binds and gags Madame Renault and then slips out in his overcoat to bury the body on the golf course where it will easily be found. Excellent. Just so. Well, then what happened? Then the justice that he had so long eluded overtakes him. An unknown hand stabs him in the back. Now, Hastings, you understand what I mean when I talk of two crimes. What about the piece of lead piping? Ha! Bravo! You remember it. To disfigure the victim's face so that it would be unrecognizable. And the dagger? There must have been two daggers there. Yes. They stabbed Tramp with one dagger to give credence to Madame Renault's tale. The second killed Conneau himself. Jacques must have had two daggers made. So? What now? Now we must start all over again. What time is the afternoon boat from Calais? About five, I believe. That will do very well. We shall just have time. Why are we going back to England? To find a possible witness. Who? 
Miss Bella Duvin. I think I shall be able to find her, particularly with the help of this photograph. He had found it in Jack Renner's desk. With love from Bella was scrawled across the corner, but it wasn't that that made my blood run cold. The likeness was not first rate, but for all that, it was unmistakable to me. It was the face of Cinderella. The Dulcie Bella Kids. That was the name she and her sister were known by. And Poirot tracked them down to a nasty little theatre in Coventry. There she was. There they both were. One flaxen-haired, one dark. Matching as to size, with short, fluffy skirts and big bows in their hair. They danced and did quite tricky acrobatic feats. Charming, don't you agree? Oh, I don't think I can sit through the rest of the bill. I need a breath of fresh air. I'll see you back at the hotel. I'll go by all means, mon ami. I shall stay to the end. It was only a few steps from the theatre to our hotel. I took a large whiskey and soda up to the sitting room and sat staring into the dwindling fire. Suddenly, I was aware of someone standing behind me. I saw you in front. When you got up to go, I slipped on a cloak and came after you. What are you doing here? Was the man with you the detective? Yes. Is he looking for me? Oh, don't cry. Please don't cry. You're safe with me. I'll take care of you. Look. I know everything. Oh, no, but you don't. I think I do. Uh, why did you take the dagger? I was afraid there might be fingerprints on it. Are you going to give me up to the police? Of course I'm not. Why not? Because I love you. You can't. Not if you know. What do you know, then? Well, I know that you came to see Renault that night. He offered you a check and you tore it up. And, and then you left the house. Go on. What then? I don't know whether you knew Jack Renner would be coming that night, but you waited. Just before 12, you saw a figure on the golf links, and you recognised the overcoat as Jack's. Go on. You had threatened to kill him in your letter, and now you knew about Mart. You plunged the dagger into him. I, I don't believe for a moment that you meant to kill him. You're right. I can see it all as you tell it. And you say you love me. Knowing what you do, how can you love me? I don't know. I think love is like that, a, a thing one cannot help. I don't ask for anything in return. Love him still if you want to, but let me help you. That's that's all I ask. You think that I love Jack? What as I love you? Never as I love you. Oh, Cinderella. What a pretty picture. Poirot. Help me. Quick, I'll hold him. <laughs> Up, Hastings. Is this not a little high-handed? Get out of here, Cinderella, as fast oh. as you can. Oh. oh, mon ami, you do this sort of thing very well. The strong man holds me in his iron grasp, and I am helpless as a child. <laughs> but all this is uncomfortable and slightly ridiculous. Let us sit down and be calm. You won't go after her. Am I, Giro? Let me go. Without doubt, I shall be able to find her when the time comes. I suppose I haven't got the right any more to ask what happens next. On the contrary. We are going back to France without delay. We? Oui. Of course. You know very well you can't afford to let Papa Poirot out of your sight. We crossed the channel by the morning boat and went straight back to the Hotel des Bains. A letter had been left for Poirot at the reception desk. Dear Monsieur Poirot, if you get this, I beg of you to come to my aid. I have no one to turn to. And at all costs, Jack must be saved. I implore you on my knees to help us. Martha Dobray. You'll go? At once. I was in despair. I had no idea what to do. They won't even let me visit Jack in prison. And I'm going mad. Is it true what they say, that he doesn't deny the crime? I fear so, mademoiselle. But it's impossible. He couldn't have done it. I don't believe no, it. Neither do I believe it, mademoiselle. But then why doesn't he speak? I don't understand. Perhaps because he is screening someone. Screening someone? Do you mean his mother? <laughs> I suspected her from the very beginning. 
Who inherits all that vast fortune? She does. It is easy to wear widow's weeds and play the hypocrite. Mademoiselle, if we are to work together, we must have things clear. First, I will ask you a question. Yes, monsieur. Are you aware of your mother's real name? <laughs> are they there? No, no, no. Calm yourself, Egypt. I see that you do know. Now, a second question. Did you know who Monsieur Renault really was? Monsieur Renault? Ah, I see you do not know that. Then I shall explain a few of the facts to you, but I must be brief. We have to go to saint Ome to be present when Jacques is brought before the court. Please save him, monsieur. I love him so. Save him. Save him. I know. Do you deny that you were in Merlinville on the night of the crime? I have told you that I was in Cherbourg. He was a changed man. His cheeks had fallen in and there were deep black circles round his eyes. He made no attempt to defend himself. It was obvious to me that his only concern was to conceal anything that might incriminate Bella. I have no alternative but to commit you for trial. Monsieur Ote, I swear that I did not kill my father. Monsieur le juge! Monsieur le juge! How dare you disturb the sitting of the court? There is a lady here who, who says... Who says what? This is highly irregular. Get out! But a slender figure, dressed all in black, her face hidden by a long veil, had made her way into the courtroom. You are the juge d'instruction, Monsieur Ote. She raised her veil, and I was seized with fear. But though as like her as two peas, this was not Cinderella. It was the face I had seen in the photograph Poirot had found in Jack Renault's room. My name is Bella Duvine. I wish to give myself up for the murder of Monsieur Renault. There is a letter for you, mon ami. I suspect it is from your little acrobat. My friend, you will know all by the time you get this. Nothing that I can say will move Bella. She has gone to give herself up. You will know now, now that, that I, I deceived, deceived you, and that where you gave me trust, I repaid you with lies. But once I knew that you thought I was Bella, and that you intended to save me, I knew I had to use you to help me save her. So I went on lying. But as soon as Bella read in the paper that Jack had been arrested, it was all up. I'm very tired. I can't write any more. Dulcie Duveen. And you mean to say you knew all along? Yes, my friend. Why didn't you tell me? To begin with, I could hardly believe it conceivable that you could make such a mistake. The sisters are very alike, but by no means incapable of distinguishment. Why didn't you tell me that night in the hotel in Coventry? Oh, you were rather high-handed in your methods. You did not give me a chance. And I was a little hurt at your want of faith in me. But where am I to find her? There's no address on the letter. There's a French stamp, that's no, no, all. No, 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 Do not excite yourself. Leave it to Papa Poirot. I will find her for you as soon as I have a few minutes. Ah, Monsieur Jacques, my heartiest congratulations. I have to come and see you. What's going to happen to Bella? I went through all that to protect her, and now it's all no use. If I were you, I should not distress myself unduly. The French courts are very lenient to youth and beauty and the crime passionnel. I've treated her shamefully. I should have told her the truth after I met Mart, but I was too much of a coward. Could you tell us exactly what did happen on that terrible evening? Well, as I told you, I came from Cherbourg to see Mart. The train was late and I decided to take a shortcut across the links. Then I heard a strange cry. It wasn't loud sort of choke and gasp. I came round the corner of a bush. In the moonlight, I saw a figure lying face downwards with a dagger sticking in his back. Then I looked up and saw her. She was looking at me as though she saw a ghost. All expression seemed frozen out of her face by horror. And she turned and ran. And afterwards? I thought I'd better get away as fast as I could. I went back to Cherbourg. Thank you. There is something you should know. 
Your mother has regained consciousness. I am about to go to the Villa Genevieve. Will you come with us? I will come, but I would like to ask a favour of you. Whatever you wish. How would it be if you went on first to break the news to mother that I'm free? While you break it in passant to Mademoiselle Martha. Of course, by all means. But let us be off. When we got to the villa, Poirot insisted on going up to see Madame Renault alone while I paced about the salon. It was some time before he reappeared, looking unusually grave. I would hardly have credited it, but women are very unpredictable. What has happened? I fear we are in for serious trouble. Madame Renault... Oh, uh, which... here are Jack and Martha. Ah. We came as quickly as we could. It is better you should not go up. Your mother is very upset. But I must see No, no, see no, her. no, Monsieur Jacques. But Jacques and I... In any case, do not take Mademoiselle with you. And if you do insist on going I up... I thank you for your good offices, Monsieur Poirot. But I will make my own wishes clear. Mother. I am no mother of yours. You are no son of mine. From this day and hour, I renounce you. But mother, what have I done? Your father's blood is on your head. You thwarted and defied him over this girl. And by your heartless treatment of another girl, you brought about his death. Tomorrow, I intend to take such steps as shall make it certain. You shall never touch a penny of his money. Make your way in the world as best you can with the help of a girl who is the daughter of your father's bitterest enemy. Slowly and painfully, she went back up the stairs. Jack Renault swayed and nearly fell. The events of the last few days have proved too much for him. Now, where, where, where can we take him? To the Villa Marguerite. We will look after him, Mamma and I. A doctor was sent for, who prescribed perfect rest and quiet, and advised someone to sit up with Jack. But I knew that Marta would do that anyway. Poirot and I went back to the Hotel des Bains. Has an English lady, a Miss Robinson, arrived? Yes, monsieur. She's in the little salon. Oh, good. Come along, Hastings. But who on earth is Miss Robinson? Oh, go on, man. I mean, do you think I wish to trumpet abroad in Merinvi the name of Duvigne? Cinderella. Thank you, Monsieur Poirot. Now, mes enfants, for the moment we have no time for sentiment. There is work ahead of us. Mademoiselle, were you able to do what I asked you? Here it is. But that's the dagger that... I thought you said you threw it in the sea. Très bien. I am very pleased with you. Now, go now and rest yourself, mademoiselle. Hastings and I have work to do. You shall see him tomorrow. Oh, no. Wherever you're going, I'm coming no, too. No, no, But mademoiselle... I'm it... coming too, and that is that. Oh, very well. But it will not be amusing. In all probability, nothing will happen. It was quite dark now, and there was a cool breeze. Poirot set off in the direction of the Villa Genevieve, but when we were passing the Villa Marguerite... I should like to assure myself that all is well with Jacques Renault. Come in with me, Hastings. It would be best if Mademoiselle perhaps remained outside. Madame de Broglie might say something which would wound her. Do you see the shadow on the blind up there? Mm -hmm. That's Martha de Broglie, surely. Then that is where we shall find Jacques Renault. He is still very feverish, but he is sleeping. That is the great thing. Maman made him a tisane. Is the doctor coming back? Not unless we send for him. We will come again in the morning. Uh, permit me to show you out, monsieur. I hope we have not troubled you, madame. Uh, not at all, monsieur. This is a trying time for us all. At least monsieur Jacques is in safe hands now. She will sit by his side all night with her embroidery. She wants nothing more than to be with him. If you should need us at any time, do not hesitate to telephone us. We shall be at the Hôtel des Bains. Good night, madame. That didn't take you very long. I simply needed to see that all was well. You see the shadow? She is still at her post. Well, where now? To the Villa Genevieve. The villa was in total darkness. Poirot took up a position behind some bushes in the drive where we had a good view of the house. We were almost immediately underneath the window of Madame Renault's bedroom. The window was open. I do not expect anything to happen for at least an hour. So what are we supposed to do? Watch Madame Renault's room. It may be as long as two hours. Oh, oh my God! My God, where is she? 
That didn't come from her home. A light's come on on the other side of the house. There are two people fighting. Me, Tonnerre. Francoise must have changed her room. Now, quickly, up the tree and through the window. <laughs> but take care, Dulcie. Take care, nothing. This is child's play to me. <laughs> oh, dear, the door of the room is locked and bolted. It will take too long to burst it open. Where is Francoise? Let me try. <laughs> no, 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 it is useless. Francoise, Francoise. You're wasting your energy. I'm the only one who can do anything. Huh? Where are you going? I'm going to climb round to the window by the outside. Oh, be careful, you'll be killed. No, 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 you forget she is a professional acrobat. Let us pray she is in time. Oh. 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 What's going oh, on? Why didn't you tell me she changed her room? Where is your mistress? In the room, down the oh, passage, you... this way. But you can't get in. The door's locked and bolted oh. on the inside. It's all over. What? She's safe? I got here just in time. Thank God you came. I was nearly strangled. Where is it? Over there. Dead? I think so. That marble fender's got a very sharp edge and it was a very heavy fall. I'm sorry. Sorry? But for you, I would have been killed. But who is it? The murderer of Monsieur Renault and the would-be murderer of Madame Renault. The figure was wrapped in a fold of some dark material. I knelt down and lifted it up and looked into the dead, beautiful face of Marthe de Broglie. No, my friend. It was not a dream. I simply don't understand. Surely it was Bella Duveen who killed Renault. She said she did. But that was simply to save the man she loved from the guillotine. But didn't Jack Renault say that he... He said they both arrived at the scene at the same moment. Each took the other to be the perpetrator of the crime. But neither of them was the murderer. It was a cold-blooded, premeditated crime which could only have been committed by someone who knew what the Renaults themselves intended to do. And then I remembered what Marta Dobray had told us about seeing the quarrel with the tramp. What if she had seen the tramp's death and not been called away by her mother, as she said? And what if she had heard the conversation between the Renaults which followed? What possible motive could she have had for killing Renault? Money. Renault was a millionaire several times over, and at his death, half of that vast fortune would pass to his son. Or oh, that is what Jack believed, and what Martha counted on. But Renault stood inexorably in the way of her marriage with Jack. She knew that he was planning to contrive his own death. She had only to step in at the right moment and turn the farce into grim reality. But what about the daggers? What, what about the one that Dulcie stole? Jacques had three daggers made. One he gave to his mother, the second to Bella, and the third to Marta Dobroy. Oh. That was why I asked your little friend to search among her sister's effects. Bella's dagger was safe at home. It was Marta's dagger that killed Renault, and Madame Renault's dagger that was stuck into the body of the tramp. And then Marthe realized that she had to kill Madame Renault to prevent her cutting Jack out of her will. Ah, uh -huh. that was a little contrivance of my own. I persuaded Madame Renault to play that little scene in front of the young couple so that Marthe would be forced out into the open. Oh. What absolutely bewilders me is how she managed to get to the Villa Genevieve before we did. Oh, that is quite simple. She slipped out of the Villa Marguerite by the back way while we were talking to her mother in the hall. But the shadow on the blind. We saw it from the road. Ah, my friend, what an imbecile I was. It was the shadow of her mother. One is old, one is young, but the profiles are exactly alike. But for your little acrobat with her wrists of steel, we would certainly have been too late, and Marta Dobray would have escaped through the window. When did you first begin to suspect her? When she told us she had overheard the quarrel in the garden? My friend. Do you remember when we drove into Merhamville that first day? Mm. You asked me if I had noticed a young 
goddess standing at the gate, and I replied that I had seen only a girl with anxious eyes. That is how I have thought of Marta Dobroy from the beginning. The girl with the anxious eyes. Why was she anxious? Not on Jacques Renault's behalf, for she did not know then that he had been in Merlinville the previous evening. By the way, how is Jack Renault? Not much better. But he still knows nothing. He's still at the Villa Marguerite. But Madame de Bray has disappeared. The police are looking for her. Was she in with her daughter, do you think? We shall never know. Madame is a lady who can keep her secrets. And I doubt very much if the police will ever find her. What is your friend Giro going to say of all this? He knows already. <laughs> He has a crisis of the nerves. He has been obliged to return to Paris. A few days later, Jack Renault came to see us with a resolute expression on his face. Monsieur Poirot, I've come to say goodbye. I'm sailing for South America almost immediately. I mean to start a new life out there. You go alone, Monsieur Jack? My mother goes with me. I shall try. No one else? What do you mean? A girl who loves you very dearly, who has been willing to lay down her life for you? Bella, how could I ask her? After all that's happened, could I go to her? Women have an infinite capacity for understanding. Yes, but I've been such a damned fool. You have a new and wonderful life before you. Ask her to share it with you. You may not realize it, but your love for each other has been tested in the fire and not found wanting. You have both been willing to lay down your lives for each other. And what, you may ask, became of Captain Arthur Hastings and his little acrobat? I never knew your name was Arthur. It's a closely guarded secret. But what am I to call you? It can't be Bella, since it isn't your name, and... And Dulcie seems so unfamiliar. Then you'll have to go on calling me Cinderella. And you all know how the best fairy tales come to an end. In Agatha Christie's Murder on the Links, Hercule Poirot was played by John Moffat, Captain Arthur Hastings by Jeremy Clyde, and Dulcie Devine by Madeline Smith. Madame Renault, Joan Matheson, Jack Renault, Stephen Tompkinson, Madame de Bray, Petra Davis, Marc de Bray, Francesca Buller, Judge Ote, David King, Inspector Bex, Geoffrey Whitehead, Inspector Giro, Vincent Brimble, Sergeant of Police, Ken Cumberledge. The elderly servant, Francoise, was Barbara Atkinson. The young servant, Leonie, Joanna Mackey. The hotel receptionist, Danny Schiller. The doctor, Brian Miller. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Murder on the Links was dramatized for radio by Michael Bakewell and directed by Enid Williams. Corpse Too Many by Ellis Peters, dramatized by Alan Downer. With Glyn Houston as Brother Cadfail and Jane Slavin as Goddess Aidney. Brother Cadfail? Ah, yes, sir. Uh... Brother Oswald. Come, come along, boy, come along. Yes, sir. Oh, this heat will be the death of me. Oh, and you toiling away out here, an example to us all, Brother Cadvile. <laughs> well, I've lived under hotter suns than this. And sadly, the compost won't find his own way into the cabbage bed. <laughs> oh, well, here's a youngster who says he's not afraid of hard work. 
How would you like him as a helper? Oh, gladly. What's your name, lad? Godric, sir. Uh, speak up, boy. He mumbles. Godric, sir. How old are you? Seventeen. Oh, you're small for your age. Oh, I can work hard and I'm quick to learn. I'll do whatever you tell me. <laughs> oh, well, so you shall then. Well, fetch yourself a sickle from over there uh, by the hut. Eh? Yes, sir. Another family trying to keep its children out of the war. It would seem so. He was brought here by a good woman of the town. He's to be taught as a lay servant. There's a year's endowment with him, so Prior Robert has agreed to take him in, and he'll attend school with the novices. Ready, sir? Oh, good. Well then, Godric, work hard and see you come to Vespers with Brother Cudvile. Yes, sir. And after supper, Brother Paul, the master of the novices, will tell you your duties and show you your bed. Uh, you'll sleep in the dortoir with the others. Yes, sir. Good, good. Well, mind you pay attention to what Brother Cudvile says and be obedient to him. <laughs> I will, sir. Good, good, good. <laughs> ah, well then, uh, Godric, come with me and I'll show you what you're taking on. Are you in charge of all the gardens? I am. And you do all the work on your own? Well, they've offered me Brother Athanasius as an assistant, but he's deaf, ancient, and doesn't know a useful herb from a weed. God bless you. So I politely but firmly decline. You should have helpers. Oh, I did have two until recently. Youngsters like yourself. But their families belong to Empress Maud's faction. And with the approach of King Stephen's army, they both felt there were safer places to be than here in Shrewsbury under siege. Well, they're saying in the town that the siege can't last much longer. Well, the King's men have been camped beyond the foregate for a month now. It can only be a matter of time. Oh, it's not right. Before King Henry died, he made all the barons acknowledge the Empress Maud as his heir. She was his only living child. She should be queen. Well, Stephen is King William's grandchild, just as Maud is. But he's not the son of the last king. Count Stephen seized the throne when the Empress was away in Normandy. And now, what's to come of it all but bloodshed and deaths? Godric, here in the monastery, we're in a battlefield as much as in the town, since our gates are never closed to any. And there's many a man about eager to buy favour with King Stephen by carrying tales... So best keep your thoughts in your head. They are much safer there. I'm sure I can trust you. Just keep your lips locked when among others. Yes, sir. Now then, um, your task for today uh, yeah, is to clear these pea plants, sir. Uh, cut them off close to the ground. And we'll use them later to give goodness to the soil. Oh, do you know how to use one of these things? Oh, I'll soon learn. Uh, it's hard on the hands, mine. I don't mind, I don't mind. <laughs> Well, when I've uh, finished my cabbage patch, I'll come and help you. Yes, sir. In a smooth arc? Yes, sir. Yes? Well done. Ah. Oh, no need to make a penance of it, lad. <laughs> Not in the heat. You'd be like me. You strip off to the waist and be comfortable. All right. I'm all right as I am for the moment, sir. Thank you. Are you now? I am not waiting outside these walls forever, Prescott. No, Your Grace. Four weeks now, and still they defy me from the battlements. Oh, their provisions can't last much longer. I've been too patient, that's the trouble, too generous. Till now, I've always held the doors open for penitents to come in, and this is the result. Your Grace. Yes, Adam, what is it? There are two here requesting audience with Your Grace. Not now. One of them's a young lady, and she has no lodging yet, and, well, in view of the lateness oh, of the Oh, very other... well. Who's the other? Hugh Berenger of Maysbury. Robert Berenger's son. You know him, Prescott? I do. He's a friend of Fitz Alan of Aidney, who lead the resistance here. Until now, I'd have thought him your enemy. Then let him wait. I'll see the lady first. Well, madam? Your Grace, my name is Aileen Seward. It was the wish of my late father that you should be given the keys of the two castles we hold. I humbly do so now. We can race for your Grace five knights and more than forty men at arms, all at your disposal, should you have need of them. I thank you for your pains. There is something else, your Grace, and I say it with great sorrow. Yes? I have a brother, Giles. He should have been the one to perform this duty, but... After an open quarrel with my father, he took the part of the Empress Maud and left home to join her party. I see. I hope you will not see this as a reason to refuse what I bring, but will use it freely, as my father would have wished. 
Your brother, is he inside the castle now? I don't know. There's been no communication between us since he left home, but it's rumored that he fled to France. Well, child, God forbid I should add to your sorrows. Your fealty is as dear to me as that of any earl or baron, and I take it with all my heart. Now, it's almost evening, and I hear you have no lodging for the night. I'd hoped my maid and I might lodge at one of the abbey houses across the river. Adam, see Mistress Seawood safely installed. Gladly, if you'll kindly follow me. And now to Master Berenger. I'm here, my liege. Hugh Berenger of Maysbury, at your grace's service, with all that I hold. What can you muster? Six knights, your grace, some fifty men-at-arms, half of them bowmen, and all skilled. I'm told you've been an associate of Fitzalan and Aedony, who are now holding the town against us. I grew up with them, Your Grace, certainly, and still have nothing against them, save they've chosen one path and I the other. Your change of heart comes a little late in the day. Four weeks I've been in these parts without a word from you. Such an important choice required a deal of thought if it was to be made once and for all. So I've taken my time in choosing. But here I am. Have you brought your force with you? No, three bowmen only. It seemed folly to leave a good castle unmanned, and small service to you to ask that you should feed fifty more. A young man, aren't you betrothed to Fook Aidan, his daughter? I am. Or I was. These uncertain times have forced a lot of changes. I don't even know where the girl is now, or whether the bargain still holds. Aidan, his daughter, is thought to be in hiding in the town. It would please me to have the lady in safe keeping in case my plans have to be altered. When the way is clear, you, of all people, should be able to find her for me. Your Grace, I came with that idea also in mind. Good. Should I have occasion to call you, where will you be found? At the Abbey Guest House, if they have a room. Well, until you've earned my trust, wait in attendance there against the town's fall. My liege. Hmm. Prescott? Your Grace? We'll attack tomorrow at first light. Young Godric, grit your teeth. This may burn a little, uh, but it's very good for blisters. There. Is this your workshop? Yes, this is my domain. So many bottles. Mm, aye. aye, tinctures, balms, draughts, potions, all made from the herbs in the herb garden, and each with its own particular use. Uh, by the way, this will be your sleeping place. Uh, now, don't worry. I've spoken to Brother Paul, and the arrangement has his blessing. You see, many of the herbs are still in preparation and need regular attention, or they might spoil. So here you'll have your bed, and you can shut out the world, and me, until you're ready to come to us. How did you find out? Oh, child, I, I was 40 years about the world from end to end of it before I took the cowl. I know a girl when I see one. I tried so hard. <laughs> yes. Well, how would you have managed in the dortoir? Oh, hmm? boys aren't so clever. <laughs> and under these tunics, all bodies look the same. Does anyone else suspect? Oh, why should they? And your sleeping here will arouse no suspicion. You're my boy, and I'm responsible for you. Who's trusting too far now? You don't know who I am. Why should that matter? You've left forlorn here to weather out the storm, and that's enough for me. I want to tell you, for I'm a burden to anyone who befriends me now, and likely to be a hostage when the town falls to Stephen's army, which will happen any day. Brother Catfall, I am daughter to Vizalan's chief ally and friend. My name is Goddess Aideny.
Well, Prescott, the castle's fallen, Your Grace, and mercifully with little damage. This is a stronghold you need never lose again. Good. I want no losing in the town. Oh, my liege, you've shown too much mercy in the past. You've said as much yourself. The men... No looting. Our urgent business is with the garrison of the castle. Your Grace. Adam. We've combed the fortress from battlements to dungeons, but there's no sign of either Fitzalan or Aideny. Scour the town. I want them found, and quickly. I might have searched the abbey, too. I owe the Benedictines nothing, but that can wait till later. Go. Your Grace. Now, Prescott, about the garrison. How many of them were taken? Ninety-four in arms. Have them hanged from the battlements. All of them, Your Grace? It's time to strike terror, Gilbert. Hang them all. I want them out of the world before tomorrow. I'm sorry to disturb you, Godith. Uh, were you asleep? No, come in. Though how could I sleep with the thought of that slaughter still going on? I have news of your father. Yes. Uh, the word is that he and Fitzalan both got clean away at the last minute and are riding hard for Wales. Thank God for that. And as for those poor souls being hanged from the battlements, Abbot Herbert has obtained Stephen's authority to give them a Christian burial. Tomorrow, after they've been cut down... The brothers will prepare them decently for the grave. Since I was once a soldier, I have been put in charge of the work. I wish I could go with you. No. These are my father's no, people. No, God, if I won't let you. Weep for the dead if you want to. But thank God that you at least are safe. Who is it? Petronella. Yes? Who's that? Me, you Beringer. Unbar the door. Hedrick? His master Hugh. Then unbar the door, woman, and let him in. Hurry, woman, hurry. Just wait but a moment, Master Hugh. Hurry. I'm being as quick as I can. There. Ah. Come in, Master Hugh, and welcome. Are you hunted, Master Hugh? Are they close on your heels? Petronella, bar the door again. Yes. Are you in danger? Do you need a place to hide? I have no need to hide. I've sworn allegiance to the king. Then what are you doing here? Looking for Godith. Did someone send you here? No, but where else would her father place her? Who could he trust more than Petronilla, her nurse? She was here till a week ago, but she's gone. Her father sent two knights to fetch her away. I don't know where they were taking her. Edric, I'm her intended husband. I'm responsible for her. Sorry, lad, we'd like to help, but that's the way it is. And take comfort that no enemy has laid hands on her. And pray God none ever will. Well then, I must discover what I can elsewhere. Petronilla, mm. open the door for Master Hugh. Thank you both. And pray for her. We will. I won't put you in further danger, Petronilla. Edric? So much for Master Hugh. Yeah. Hunting for his bride. Mm. <laughs> yes, and a fair price he'd pay for her, too. And she a certain decoy for her father's return. Well, young Master Hugh's got his way to make with Stephen now. Yeah. And God it's his best weapon. <laughs> <laughs> but let him hunt all he may, he'll not find her. Mm. I've hidden her away in the one place no sane man will look for her. He saw me, Brother Catfield. I know he did. Who? Hugh Berringer, the man I was to marry. He saw me just now, in church. I even think he smiled. He kind of recognized you, child. A bare-legged youth squinting through a mop of hair. Oh, there's little Hugh Berringer, missus. Describe him to me. Slim build, middle height, dark complexioned. Oh, yes. I noticed him myself. A graceful fellow. Oh, he's presentable enough, but he is of no further interest to me, nor is he possessed of any rights in me. Circumstances alter fortunes. He had eyes only for Mistress Seward. Who's she? She's lodging at the guest house, the one next door to the mill. She was in church with Adam Cussell, King Stephen's deputy sheriff. There's little you, Miss Ivor. <laughs> Oh, Catfile, what if you recognised me? Well, we must take no chances. Master Barringer belongs to the King's camp. You must keep well out of his sight, and we must get you safely out of here as soon as we can. Now I'm needed at the battlements. Uh, 
Have you finished, brothers? We have, my lord. Good. The sooner all this carrion's removed, the happier I shall be. My lord, how many did you say were executed at the king's orders? Ninety-four. Why? I've counted ninety-five. Oh, they're all traitors, one more or less. What does it matter? God will require an accounting. Brother, um... Uh... Uh, Cadvine. Uh, Brother Cadvine. The man was taken in arms and hanged like the rest, and there's an end to it. Forgive me, my lord, but he is not like the rest. He wasn't even hanged like the rest. And his hands weren't bound like the rest. Come and see for yourself. The man who destroyed him is guilty of murder. You see, my lord, the thinness of the cord that took his life, the mark where it bit into his neck. I see. See to this small pit here at the nape. The mark of one end of a wooden peg. A handhold to twist and tighten the cord around his throat. Mm. You're saying he was strangled then, not hanged. And dumped here with the rest. Now, did you hang any whose hands weren't tight? None. Then yes, further proof of his murder. If further proof were needed. I mean, look, look at his fingernails. Mm. You see? Both hands black with his own blood as he clawed at the cord that was killing him. His hands were free. And look at how he's dressed. He didn't take part in the battle. Uh, Brother Cadfile, they were all stripped of their armor. Yes, but he hadn't been wearing armor. He's dressed to ride light, armed only with a dagger, as this empty scabbard testifies. Oh, uh, and there's more. Indeed. It's my belief that he wasn't killed in or near the town. And your evidence for this? Well, can you recognize this herb? <laughs> Goosegrass. A queer creeping thing that grows little hooks to hold fast. You see? Even on these tiny seeds. Now look very closely, and you'll see that this one has a sharp fold. It's bent back on itself. In the middle here. In the middle of the straight stem. Hmm? Is this important? Oh, yes, my lord. For it was caught in the furrow in this poor lad's throat. Broken by the cord that strangled him. Now, at this time of year, you'll find the stuff everywhere. Growing richly, seeding wild. But this, now this is last year's crop. Cut last autumn. Dried out for use as uh, fodder or litter. You'd find it lining the floor of a, a barn, say, uh, or a stable. And do you believe it was in a barn or a stable that this murder was committed? I do. And not too far from the town. Or the murderer would have found it simpler to dispose of the body elsewhere. What would you have me do? Treat him fairly. Keep your peace with God and man. Send out a proclamation to the townsfolk that they are free to collect their dead without fear of penalty or disfavor. And if anyone claims this youth, then you've delivered your soul. If not, well, at least you've done your duty. Brother Cadwell. Mr. Seward. You know me? I've seen you in church. Madam, this is no place for you. I said the same. But I insisted. And Master Beringer here insisted on accompanying me. They said you were in charge. I am. Is this the man? The one more than was counted? This is he. He was so young. Do you know him, either of you? No. Nor I. Ailey! What are you doing here? Adam! And you, Master Beringer, how could you bring her here to face so harrowing a scene? I needed to come. You know I have a brother. You were there when I told the king. You said he was in France. Well, how can I be sure? And as often as I don't find him dead, I can hope one day to find him living. But the garrison here were all known. There's one that isn't. I've made up my mind, Adam. If I'm to have any peace, I must see them. All of them, for myself. The lady insists. Very well. Then I'll come with you, Aileen. But when you've finished, you must leave this place at once. So, you are Brother Cadwell. And you are Master Bellinger. You don't look much like a monk. Too broad in the shoulder. Too deep in the chest. I was a soldier once. Fought at the Siege of Jerusalem. A crusader, eh? Many years ago. Don't you find the cloistered life dull after all those battles? No, I'm not finding it dull these days, my friend. But you've no enemies left to fight. Enemies come 
in many guises. Now, you're sure you've never seen this poor man? I'm sure. You seem particularly keen to identify him. I am. Why? What's so special about him? It seems to me that he wasn't in the fight here, nor captured with the garrison, nor hanged from the battlements like the rest. He was strangled. Why should anyone hate him enough to kill? People can murder without hate. Footpads, for instance. Forest robbers. You think he was murdered for gain? He's a young squire. What could he possibly have to make him worth the killing? There are those in the world who would kill for a few coins a beggar would beg in a day. Oh, well, I must get on with my work. There are still 66 unclaimed dead here. Poor souls who must be taken back to the Abbey and given decent burial. Uh, before you go, yeah. you seem a practical man. Supposing I should need your help, you wouldn't refuse it, would you, without due thought? I hope I never do anything without due thought. Hmm? <laughs> Though sometimes the thought has to shift his feet pretty briskly to keep up with the deed. And what sort of help were you seeking? Well... The king has set me rather a testing task. And sadly, I seem to be making little progress with it. Oh, dear God. Hmm? This one is Giles. I found my brother. Come, let's go to her. Madam? Sorry? I was asking where you'd like him conveyed. Oh, um... My mother's family has a tomb at St. Altman's Church, here in the town. We'll have him taken there. If you'll wait but a moment, please. Master Corsell has gone to the guardroom. He thinks he's seen something that belonged to my brother that was stacked there. At the end. Master Beringer, I've no wish to sadden the rest of your day. I came with you, madam. I'll not return without you. Ah, oh, no, here he comes. Aileen, see. This cloak. It must have been his. The clasp at the neck has the same design as the buckle of his belt. Yes, I know it. It's his. Let me lay it over him. It was kindly done, Adam. I shan't forget it. If only I'd known who he was, I'd have saved him for you, no matter what the cost. How? How could you have saved him and let the others die? For him, I would have found a way. Please don't blame yourself. You only did as you were ordered. And at least now, I can be sure. Good morning, Godric. Hard at work, I see. <laughs> we, we'll make a gardener of you yet. Morning, Brother Catfowl. Have you been burying the dead? No, lad, not I. That task fell to others. No, I was sent for it to the King's camp. Why? Well, it seems that the King's Sheriff, Prescott, told Stephen of this unexpected hair that I've started, and... <laughs> well, I'm forgetting. You've heard nothing of all this, have you? Well, what? What's the mystery? Yesterday I found an extra body among those executed at the battlements. A lad who wasn't hanged, but strangled. Murdered? Yes, child, no doubt about it. Strangled with a thin cord, then cast among the king's victims to cover up the crime. Is he known? No, but the king has charged me to bring his murderer to justice. Is he being buried with the others? No, he's in church. Lying on a bier before the altar. Let me look at him. Yes? Yes, all right. I want all who come to services to pass him by in the hope that someone may give him a name. I know him, Brother Catfile. His name? Nicholas Faintree. He was a squire of Fitzalan's. Poor Nicholas. I've known him since I was a child. But what was he doing in Shrewsbury? Fitzalan's business was all but finished here. I don't know. But there's a couple in the town who were close in all Fitzalan's plans. I'll write you a note. They'll recognize my hand and tell you all they know.
Father Cadfael. Let me begin my tale before the battle. Leave nothing out, Edric. My goddeth is safe in his care. Ah. Fitzalan knew the end was near, so he made provision for whether he lived or died. And he left his treasury here with us. To make sure it reached Empress Maud. Mm. And we fixed a signal. If any of Fitzalan's party came with a certain token, private to us who knew, we should deliver the treasury to them, and they would convey it with all speed over the border and into Wales. And they came early next day, two of them, just before the assault on the castle. Mm. Two squires, young Nicholas Faintry being one. They almost left it too late. Mm. By this time, we'd move the valuables out into the garden I have at Frankwell, so there'd be no bridge to cross if we needed to move at short notice. Mm -hmm. Now, there was nothing we could do in broad daylight, so I took the two lads to Frankwell and left them in my barn, with instructions to hide there with their horses until it was dark. And the treasury? We packed that into two pairs of saddlebags and hid it in a cavity in a dry well nearby. Do you know if it's still there? As soon as life returned to normal, I looked. It's gone. Ah. We hoped they'd got clean away, but if poor Nicholas was murdered... Ah. I suppose it was enough to tempt any man. <sighs> he seemed such a nice young lad. <sighs> but who can tell what lies behind a decent face? You think Faintree was murdered by this fellow? Who escaped keeping the treasure for himself? What else is one to think? Did you know the lad? We'd never seen him before. His name was Torold Blund. A Saxon name? And looked it too. Blue eyes, hair, the colour of sand. But he's your murderer, Brother Cadfile. No doubt about it. Well, uh, my thanks to you both. I must be on my way. Oh, uh, there's one more thing I should tell you before you go. Uh -huh. uh, since you're taking care of Goddith. Um, what's that? Well, about two o'clock in the afternoon, after the King's men had taken over the town, Hugh Beringer came. All concerned for Goddith and asking where he might find her. Ah. Oh, we told him nothing, of course. <laughs> no. But after he'd gone, Petronella went on about how well we'd hidden the girl, even touching on the plans to move Fitzalan's gold. In a roundabout sort of manner. Aye. And as she talked, I thought I heard a sound outside. Like the scuff of a boot on the cobbles. We looked at once, of course. But there was no one to be seen. You think that Beringer might have overheard? Uh, I wouldn't put it past him. He moves like a lynx, that man. So, Brother Cadvile, this is where you spend your more peaceful hours. The weeds will grow, Master Beringer, even in God's garden. A far cry from harvesting dead men. How long had you been standing there? A while. My ears are keen, but I never heard a sound. That boy who was murdered, you found out his name in the end. How? No one in the town seemed to know him. All questions get their answers in time. And all searches are bound to find? You have no help today. There's corn to be harvested in the field, Armour the River. Godric is helping with that. He can handle a sickle. Oh, yes, yes, quite well. Well, I trust you have sound judgment in the matter. It would be sad if young Godric came home short of a foot. Mm, yes, sir. Brother Catford, sorry to disturb you at supper. Yes, sir. Godric, what is it? I found a wounded man down by the river. A Saxon by his hair and eyes. He's been there a night and a day. He's in need of attention. Does anyone else know about this? No, nobody saw him but me. He's lying deep among the bushes. I gave him a drink of water from my bottle and told him I'd bring help as soon as I could. He called me Ganymede. Right. We'll hide some meat and bread in your tunic while I fetch salve and bandages. Then we'll be on our way. Who's there? It's me. Ah, oh, Ganymede. 
good lad. I just as a friend to us both. God bless you, brother. Friends I sorely need. Can you rise and go? Not far. I've lost a lot of blood, most of it into the river. I'll carry you then. Don't put your arms around my neck. All right. I'm too great a load. Do as you're told. Where are you taking me? The old mill. You'll be safe there. It's only a few minutes away. Put him down here. Hmm? I found some dry sacks he can lie on. Ah, good for you. All right. There. That's right. Now, let's take a look at you. Oh, I'm Brother Cadval, by the way, and as Welsh as Dewey Shant. Oh, and this boy of mine is Godric. Trust us both, or neither? I trust you both. Good. Uh, Godric, uh, uh, help me with his jerkin. I want to see this shoulder. I'll have trouble paying my shot. Oh, our charges are quite low. A straight story will buy such hospitality as we are offering. Ah, an arrow did this? Hmm. Yes, I couldn't stop it bleeding. Uh, thank God it isn't serious. Where uh, are your other wounds? There's a sword cut in my thigh. I'll look at that in a moment. Godric, look, I'll, I'll need some water. River water? Well, it's better than none. Search around, find something to carry it in. Yes. Huh? Now then, uh, your thigh. There. Ah. Ah, well, this isn't such a deep gash either. But you have a rich variety of bruises. I'm lucky to be alive. Who was hunting you? The king's men. Who else? And still will be. Unless they believe me drowned. Then they'll be searching for your body. The seven always yields up its dead. No, no, no. Keep still. I owe you a name, at least. I think I know your name already. It's Torald Blund. How on earth Never you... mind about that now. Now, let's get this thigh bound up. Hmm. Oh, it's clean enough. It's knitting already. Uh. Tell me your story. Starting where Edric Flesher left you and Nicholas Faintry with Fitzalan's treasury at the barn in Frankwell. Are you some sort of wizard? Time is short now. Go on. We recovered the treasury from the dry well and rode as soon as it was dark. But when we reached a stretch of woodland, Nick's horse fell lame. He'd picked up a caltrop and was cut to the bone. Caltrop? We're on a forest path oh. away from the field of battle. It was a caltrop. The spike was embedded in the hoof. I know. I wrenched it out. And what did you do? Well, the poor beast was foundered. He could go, but not far and not loaded. So we agreed that Nick should hide in a nearby woodman's hut while I rode with both horses to the farm of a man named Ulf. He's distant kin on my mother's side. And the treasury? Went with me. Ulf gave me a fresh horse. I transferred Nick's half of the load to the new nag and rode back to the hut. Uh -huh. I thought Nick would be looking out for me. But he wasn't. That made me uneasy. So I tethered the horses with a single knot, to be off fast, if need be, and went into the hut. The door was half open. It was pitch black inside. I went in cautiously. But I fell over him, Nick, in the middle of the floor. I sensed at once he was dead. I heard the dry fodder rustle behind me. I threw up my right arm from instinct, I suppose. And the man's cord went round my wrist as well as my throat. Yes, as I can see the marks that it made. I lashed out in fright and jerked the cord out of his hands. I brought him down. We wrestled in the hay, each trying for the other's throat. Then by chance my hand struck a half-rotten board that was lying loose on the floor, and I hit him with it, two-handed. Good for you. I doubt I did him any lasting damage. But it knocked him witless long enough for me to run. And run I did. Made off with the horses like a hunted hare. Well, there's no shame in that. I didn't get very far. The king's patrols were thick as bees in a swarm. And they were stopping everything that moved. Two days I hid up in a copse. Then Thursday, after nightfall, I tried again. Taking another road. And that was when they saw me. They had me trapped. I had only one way to run. Towards the river. I took the saddlebags from both horses, turned the beasts loose, and ran. But the pursuit was close now, and one of the fellows gave me this slash in the thigh. In which I've dressed for you now, as best that I can. Now cover yourself decently with this blanket. I look at your shoulder again. So, it was then that you took to the water? Yes. 
Saddlebags and all. And got this clout from an arrow? Yes. I went under and the seven carried me downstream. Finally, I dragged myself ashore and crawled into the bushes, afraid to stir. That's where Godric found me. And that's the truth of it. Not the whole truth. Hmm? But Godric found no saddlebags on you. Brother Cadval, you'll think me ungrateful after all you've done, but... Well, now I'm sole custodian of the treasury, and I... I understand. I understand. A trust is a trust. For your better peace of mind, the talk is that Fitzalan and Aidney both got clean away. Oh, good. And what of Nick? He's with God. We're burying him tomorrow within the abbey. He'll have a prince's tomb. There. That's better. I've got some water. Ah, good. Now, bear that wound in his shoulder. How do you feel? Weak. Uh, he'll feel much better once he's slept. Now then, friend, I want you to drink this strong cordial of my own brewing. It helps keep wounds from festering and eases the heart. Here, let me help you. Thank you, young Ganymede. Godric will look in on you tomorrow as often as he can. I have other matters to attend to. But I'll come down in the evening and dress your wounds again. In the meantime, we've uh, brought you some meat and cheese and bread and uh, a flask of wine. Thank you. If... If there's any water left... Here. Thank you. Oh. He's asleep already. Well, child, it's time to go. We mustn't be late for Compton. Who is he, Brother Cadfile? And why are they hunting him? I'll tell you as we go. He's very handsome. His eyes are cornflower blue. He looks so pale and he's eaten nothing. <laughs> He'll be ravenous in the morning. <laughs> who was Ganymede? A beautiful youth who was cupbearer to Jove and much loved by him. Oh. Uh, but some say it's another name for Hebe. And who's Hebe? Another cupbearer to Jove and much loved by him. But a beautiful maiden. Ah. <laughs> Come along, my child. Or we'll be in trouble with the prior. Boy. Madam. I'm Aileen Seawood. I'm looking for Brother Cadvile. He's gone to borrow the abbot's mule. He has duties the other side of the town. What's your name? Godric, madam. I'm his assistant. You've been crying, Godric. A little. It was a great honour for Master Faintree to be buried in the Abbey Church. No doubt Brother Cadvile's doing. I don't think the abbot required much persuading. I attended the funeral service with Master Berenger. I saw you. We buried my brother Giles yesterday at St. Altman's. He was one of the castle garrison, hanged with the others from the battlements. I'm sorry. There was no shame attached. He made his choice and stood by it to the end. Anyway, these are my brother's clothes. Jacket, hose and cloak... He no longer needs them, and they're still good. So someone may be glad of them. Perhaps you'd ask Brother Cadval to dispose of them, however he thinks best. something for a poor cripple and God will reward you. I will indeed. And better than a small coin too. No doubt you feel the cold uh, even on these summer nights. Oh, I do. Though sometimes if I'm lucky I'm allowed near the King's Guard post by the city gate. I can enjoy the glow of their fire there. Here's something even better. A cloak? Oh, that'll keep the winter chill away. Oh. <laughs> I can't believe it. 
How often have I wished the good God had sent me such a cloak? Then say a prayer for a gentle lady who sends it to you by my hand. <laughs> God be with you, friend. <laughs> a cloak? Lame husband with a fine cloak? <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so, young sir, I find you both together. <clears throat> and how is our patient this evening? Brother Catfile? Yeah, Godric? He knows hmm? that I'm a girl. Ah. Um, how did he make the discovery? We wrestled. Wrestled? Yes, well, he thought he was fit enough to travel, and I told him he wasn't. You goaded me. You should have had the good sense to do as you were bid, or at least the courtesy to be gentle with your friends. I wasn't rough, exactly. Uh, you hurled yourself on top of In me. In fun, that's all. And Anyway, you asked God for God is torrowed. No, that's enough. <laughs> so, he knows you're a girl. And what else does he know? Everything. And he's told me the only thing he didn't tell you last night... Where the treasury is hidden. And now he wants to tell you. Well, well go on, Toro, tell him. It's still in the saddlebags. Hidden on a mooring chain under the first arch of the stone bridge. Down under the water, out of sight. As if no one's found it. No, no, we should have heard. Brother Cadvile, I must get it safely to Fitzalan in France without any more loss of time. And I'll take Godith with me and deliver her safe to her father. Is that what you want, Godith? Yes, as soon as he's fit to travel. Right then, uh, well, let's see how his shoulder is progressing. We'll unwind his bandage, got it, till it sticks. Now, uh, let me tell you what I've been doing while you two have been uh, swearing allegiance. What? Confirming all that you've told me. I visited your kinsman, Alf, and uh, he bore out your story to the last detail. Seems he even found several more caltrops strewn across the path by the hut. Caltrops? A martial cruelties, my child. For scattering under the hooves of cavalry. Strewn on a woodland path. Well, why should anyone do that? To hold us by the hurt. What else? Ow! I told you that it would stick. Well, I didn't mean to hurt you, Torald. I tried to ease it off. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me. Yes, uh, someone knew in advance what you and Nicholas were about and the road that you take and laid his trap waiting for you to spring it. Well, young man... You're a credit to us both. It's healing well. I'm afraid you'll have a scar there for the rest of your life. Now, hold steady. This may burn. It's my belief the king got wind of the matter and sent some of his men secretly to get the treasury. Ow! They say he's desperate for money. Perhaps. But there's evidence of only one man. One man attacked you in the hut. One horse was left to graze nearby. Large and well shod. Well, the marks were clear to see. No. No, the thief wasn't there to fill King Stephen's coffers, but was bent on his own enrichment. Now then, lad. Is this yours? Mine? No. No Nicholas Faintries, neither? No, that didn't belong to a poor squire. Let me see. It's a gemstone of some sort. A topaz, mounted in a silver claw. I'd say it was broken off the hilt of a dagger. And a very fine weapon, too. Where did you find it? In the hut where Nicholas was murdered, embedded in the floor. Well, if, if it isn't mine or Nick's, it must have been his, mustn't it? The murderers. It's the obvious conclusion. It must have snapped off against the ground as we struggled. Then it will lead us to him. Find the dagger, and we find the murderer. Nick was a good friend to me, Brother Cutfile. And I should stay to avenge him, but... You have more pressing duties. I understand. You'll help us escape, won't you? And nothing simpler, child. All I have to do is conjure two good horses out of empty air, retrieve your hidden treasure for you, and see you safely into Wales. I said you were a wizard. Oh, yes, well, I... What is it? Nothing. My ears are playing me tricks. Well, now, Godric, we must be getting back to Vespers. Oh, and Toro. Yes? Here's a poniard for you. It served me well in Jerusalem. May it protect you now. Thank you. I should have parted with it before, but... It's good to give it to someone who needs it and won't disgrace it.
When we were in the mill, you heard something, didn't you? Possibly. You think someone overheard what we said? Perhaps. Well, who? A very fair evening, brother. Master Berenger, what brings you to this part? I was enjoying the evening here by the river. And you? Brought in all the corn, have we, Godric? All that we have here. Uh, uh, Godric, uh, save my legs, lad. Uh, run ahead and stir that lotion I've been brewing. Yes, sir. A most biddable lad. Yes, uh, he serves me well. Sir, I, I am bound for Vespers. Oh, so am I. May we walk together? Gladly. I'm in need of your skills and knowledge. Huh? Yes. I asked you the other day if you would give a request of mine fair consideration. You agreed? I did. Well, what I had in mind then was no more than a rumoured threat. Now it's a real one. I have reason to know that the King is already making plans to move on. And he's about to issue orders to commandeer for the army's use all good horses, no matter who owns them. Even the Abbey stables won't be exempt. Mm. Well, that'll be bad news for Brother Pryor. It's bad news for me, too. I have four good horses in the Abbey stables, and I have no intention of allowing them all to be drafted for the King's army. A two I can afford. How does this concern me, my lord? I turn to you for practical help. You know all this countryside. Is there a place of safety not too far away where two of my best horses can lie up for a few days until this roundup is over? Two of your best horses, you say? Two, that's right. I'll not begrudge the King the others. Yes, I do know of a place. In the Long Forest. We could ride out there together at night and uh, make the return journey on foot before morning. Excellent. Then uh, show me the way tonight. Brother Cadvile, you lived in the world all those years and never thought to marry? I did once think about it. And a very fair woman, too. Rashilda's her name was. <laughs> She'd have grandchildren by now. What went wrong? Uh, I was in the East too long. She gave up waiting and married another. Small blame to her. And in the East? Well, there were women there, too. And you were a young crusader. Hmm. Makes you wonder, does it? A little. <laughs> Sometimes I wondered about you. Why? I can't quite make you out. You're secretive, enigmatic, a natural conspirator. One knows another. When the king leaves Shrewsbury, will you go with him? Well, that depends on him. Would you credit it, the man mistrusts me still. Well, that's what comes of being secretive and enigmatic. <laughs> <laughs> There's a rumour going the rounds. Yeah? Uh, what's that? A few nights ago, there was a fellow hunted into the river, said to be a squire of Fitzalan's. They say an archer got him in the shoulder and he went down. Next day, when they caught a riderless horse, a good saddle horse, they naturally took it to be his. And? Then, if you'll believe it, they rounded up another riderless horse running loose up on the heathland. And what did they make of that? They're thinking the youth was a single bodyguard sent out from the castle with two horses when the assault came to pick up Aideny's daughter from wherever she was hidden and escape with her across the border into Wales. So, if this was the same youth who was in the river, and since both horses have been found, they assume the attempt failed. I see. Which means she's still in hiding somewhere in Shrewsbury. And now they'll be looking for her more eagerly than ever. Whoa, please. Hey. Ah, ah, we're here. What is this place? An old grange the Abbey once used. But since the times have grown unchancy, we've withdrawn our sheep and cattle and just kept two lay brothers in the house. Uh, who's there? Our uh, brother Cadvile. Uh, oh, that's one of them. Uh, brother Anselm. Uh, the other brother Lewis won't be far away. They heard us approaching. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> brother Lewis. <laughs> he can hear an old blink at ten paces. <laughs> ah, here they come. 
Oh, don't come, Red. Is it uh, you? It is. Look, Brother Lewis, it's Brother Cadfile come to see us. Oh, it's a pleasure to see your known face. Uh, but, but we hardly expected you in the middle of the night. You, I had my knife at the ready. Uh, uh, <laughs> where's your errand? Ah, uh, here, with you. Uh, yes, my lord here asked you to give stabling to these two beasts for a few days. Oh. Uh, and keep them out of the public eye. Willingly. Oh, it's a long while <laughs> since the stable here had such beauties in it. <laughs> Indeed. You must surrender them to no one but myself or Brother Carlyle. That's understood, my lord. Yes. <laughs> Come along, then, my lovely. Oh, we both love a fine horse. Come <laughs> along. Come along. Right, my lord Beringer. We've safely disposed of your horses. Now, uh, so are you ready for the long walk home? <laughs> So, Brother Cadval, you think this Master Beringer overheard what we were saying yesterday? Well, I'm sure of it. Certainly that you and Godifia are planning to escape into Wales with the treasury. But I don't understand. Why should Hugh, of all people, provide us with two good saddle horses for the journey? That doesn't make sense. I lay awake half the night thinking about that, too. And? Several possibilities occurred to me. Uh, shall I start with the worst one first? Go on. Beringer is Faintree's murderer. He somehow got wind of the fact that Torold and Faintry were escaping that night with the treasury, set his trap and waited in ambush in the hut. But who'd have told him? Well, only members of Fitzalan's council knew of the plan. And Edric Flesher. But his allegiance is beyond question. And theirs. Most of them gave their lives in that battle. All I know is that Beringer is one of nature's conspirators. Had he failed in his purpose the first time, he'd be scheming to try again. Now, suppose at this time... He sees a means of gaining three prizes in one. Three? Why? Oh, First, to obtain the treasure. For his own enrichment? Oh, yes. And second, to place Aidan's daughter in King Stephen's hands as a hostage against her father's return. And third? To dispose of the one surviving witness to his earlier crime. Me. Exactly. And what better way of doing it? Than providing us with two horses, allowing us to recover the treasury from its hiding place in the river and waiting where the horses are stable till I and Godith and the treasury fall neatly into his hands. At one stroke. It has the ring of truth about it. But for one thing. And that is? I have no great love for Hugh Berenger, but a murderer. If he can provide the king with the treasury and you two as hostages, his favoured place with Stephen would be assured. And we are losers either way. However, there is another possibility. What's that? That Beringer's a man of honour who's prepared to let you both go, provided he can recover the treasure for the king. I'd dearly like to believe it. Yes, yes, me too. The question is, are we prepared to stake our lives on it? Have we any choice? No, not really. When Stephen's men come to collect their tithe of food and horses, and they'll surely do so soon, uh, they'll leave no stone unturned. You must both be away by then. Brother Cadval, much though I love Godith and hold my own life dear, I have a sworn duty to protect that treasure. You surely can't expect me to surrender it without a fight. I don't. What? I think we must play Master Beringer at his own game. And if we succeed, you can be off into Wales with both your treasures. And he'll be left empty-handed. You have a plan? It's not without its dangers. Tell us. Well... Beringer knows as well as we do that time is running short and that we can only move under cover of darkness. He'll be watching closely. Now, since you must both remain in hiding, he'll expect me to recover the treasure. So, wherever I am, there, depend upon it, he will be too. Tonight, I shall row to the stone bridge and he will watch me pull the treasure out of the river, or so it will appear, and walk with it to the Grange, where I shall leave it with Brother Anselm and Brother Lewis. Once Beringer is safely out of the way, you two will take a small boat from where I'll have hidden it among the bushes, recover the real treasure, which you, Godith, will hide in a sack in my workshop until we're ready to make our escape tomorrow evening. Now, do you think you can do that? Of course. But there's one thing. You'll need a load to carry with you to the grains, which Beringer will think is the treasure. Well, that's a job for you. Wrap some objects in a blanket and... Uh, Anything with a bit of weight. But I also want you to put in some other things, too. I have them here in my pouch. Who's there? 
Brother Cadby. Oh, God bless you, brother. And what's this? Two visits in as many nights? I've got something more to put into your safe keeping. Oh, uh, it, it looks heavy. Oh, it is, uh, Brother Lewis. It is. Believe me. It's soaking wet, too. Here, I'll take it into the house. Oh, holy saints, what have you got in here? It's enough for you to know that I hope to come again tomorrow night with two friends to collect both it and the horses. Did you come alone? Why, are we being observed? I believe so. Good. That was my intention. What? I'll explain later. Uh, come along, then. Let's get the bundle stowed. Right. I need to be back in time for Matins. Make fast the gates. And see to it that no one enters or leaves the abbey. What is this noise? Good morning, Brother Pryor. By what right do you disturb the peace of the abbey? We come in King Stephen's name and require a tithe of your stores for His Grace's necessary provision. Also, all of your serviceable horses. But surely the abbey is exempt from such a tithe. His Grace is of no mind to extend any privileges to the abbey. Well, no doubt we shall weather it. I'm also commanded to search everywhere for the girl, Goddeth, daughter of the traitor Edeny, who is thought to be still in hiding. A girl within these precincts? Hardly. These are my orders, Brother Pryor. I'm sorry. Then make your search. Oh, we shall. And thoroughly. You men, come with me. Uh, who's there? It's me, Torold. Come in. The king's men are everywhere. Where's Goddith? I don't know. What? I overslept a little, I'm sorry. After my exertions of last night, and by the time I got here to warn her, she was gone. Where? I've no idea. But Toro, she must be safe, or they'd have called off the search by now. And the treasure? You left it here last night. Just as you instructed. Then she must have taken it with her. But where? Quickly. Slip under that bedding. Come with me. And lie still. Open up in the king's name. Brother Cadvile. Well, well. Master Cursell. You're up bright and early this morning. Search if you wish. Though I doubt you'll find any horses. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Cadvile, what happened outside the town walls? The hangings? Yes. I tried to intercede, but there was nothing I could do. The king was intransigent. I understand. There are some things a soldier shouldn't be called upon to do. I assure you I spent as little time as possible at the place of execution, but led my men off to search the town for Fitzalan and Edney. The whole ugly business was lent dignity only by your presence and that of Mistress Seawood. Well, thank you. There was little enough that I could do. I believe the king has charged you with the task of finding the boy's murderer. He has. Then I wish you good fortune. His death should be avenged. Well, I've seen all I want here. Oh, oh good, good. Uh, you won't be disturbed again. All right. You can come out now. <sighs> I couldn't get my breath under there. Oh, I thought your last moment had come. Me too. For the third time this morning. They started combing the riverbank at first light. Six men and an officer riding. Then they came towards the old mill and I had to make a run for it. That was the first time. And the second? A little later, as I swam the brook. I could have sworn the officer, the same officer, had seen me then. It even seemed he'd lifted his bridle hand to me a fraction. But I looked again, once I was safe across and hidden in a haystack, and he turned and was riding away. What did he look like, this officer? I only saw him from a distance, but he was thin-faced and he... Of course. It was Berenger, wasn't it? I should have recognized him from last night. And he was wishing you Godspeed. Oh, take heart, Torold. It seems all is still running as we planned. Except... Yes. Where's Godith? Hello. 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 Hello.
Brother Cadvale! Missiles, I beg you, let me pass. Brother Cadvale! Mr. Seward! I need to talk to you! There are soldiers at every gate. How did you get in? I told them I had permission from Adam Corsell to attend Mass, but it's you I seek, and urgently. What is it, my child? Goddess is safe. She's at my house. She came at first light by boat, paddled down the Millbrook, knocked on my door, and begged for shelter. And you took her in? The king's enemy? I doubt that Stephen would have thought better of me had I given her up to him, and I'm sure that God would not. Have you a message for her? Yes, daughter. Tell her to have boat and bundle ready, and we'll come for her after dark. Then she's safe. Yes, thank God. With Aileen Seward. <laughs> you breed fine women here in Salop. I know. Now listen. The soldiers have finished their search, so we rest in here. Get as much sleep as you can. And you? I must go back to the Dortois with the others. I'll come for you when the time is right. Then what? We can't just march out of the gatehouse. There's no need. There's a small parish door that opens onto the foregate. It's never closed. I'll let you out there when the time comes. What about the porter? Oh, you won't pay much attention to a solitary citizen making late for home. And once I'm clear? It's only a short walk to Aileen Seward's house. The boat is hidden there. Collect Godith and the treasure and row back to where the water flows from the mill pond and into the brook. I'll be waiting for you there. Then it's on foot to the Grange. Brother Cadfile, is it you? It is. There, Brother Anselm, I told you. He said it would be tonight. I'll fetch the horses. Well, Brother Lewis. I heard you coming. <laughs> we are still being observed. Good. Things grow rough your way, so we've heard. Uh, rough enough. Mm. I'd wish my friends were out of it. Uh, most of all, these two. Oh, Brother Lewis, this is Fuke Hayden, his daughter, and this is Fitzalan's squire. Um, now, we've put some food together for their journey, and uh, Brother Anselm's fetching the horses now. They're both saddled and ready. I thank you with all my heart. Oh, God love you, child. What should a decent man do when a young woman's threatened but see her safe out of trouble, <laughs> and her young man with her? Have you got the baggage? Uh, yes, I have it here. And here are the horses. Ah, excellent, excellent. <laughs> oh, well, Godith, Torold. It's time that you were on your way. Yes. And give my love to Wales. Halt as you stand! What? Turn around slowly and keep your hands visible for the lady's sake. My men have their arrows trained on her. Master Beringer? What are you doing here? Calling the tune. And what sort of tune do you have in mind for me? Are you going to stand on your rights and marry me? I'm tempted. You've improved greatly from the fat little girl I remember. But no. You give me to the king, then, to buy his favour? No. And if it needs saying for your own comfort, I have no intention of setting the hounds on your champion's trail, either. You mean it? There are the horses. Ride as soon as you please. But that bundle Cadvile is sitting on, that I'll keep. Oh, it's... Uh, it's yours, Master Beringer. You won it fairly. What else can I say? We can go, then. And I suggest quickly, if you wish to be in Wales by daybreak. I've mistaken you, Hugh. Wish me well. With all my heart. Now, mount and Godspeed. You, friend, I ask your pardon. I don't know your name. I'm Torald Blund, a squire of Fitzalan's. Well, take good care of it, Torald. I will. And Brother Cadvile, I owe you everything. If there's anything owing, repay it to Godith. <laughs> and see you bring her safe to her father. I will. Goodbye, Brother Cadvile. I shall miss you, child. <laughs> Farewell. You, come on. She'll never come to her father a virgin. Oh, there are priests enough between here and Normandy. It's my belief that she'll come to him a wife. You know the girl better than I do. Pity. Why did you let her go? She was betrothed to me once. I had to see her into safety. And if we put up a fight? I'd have looked the biggest fool in Christendom, for I'd never have harmed the girl. You knew the treasure was here at the Grange. Why didn't you just remove it and make sure of it? Now, what would have been the fun of that? No, Cadvile, this way was more satisfying. I have the gold, and I've made my peace with Godith. I couldn't let her go to France, believing me her enemy. So, at last the game is over. And you, it seems, have won. No hard feelings? None. <laughs> I sensed there was no real mischief in the air tonight. <laughs> God be with you, Brother Cadvile. Come again to see us soon. We will. 
Right then, Cadwell. My mount is sturdy enough to bear a second passenger. Ride with me to the Abbey, and we'll take this bundle to your hut and open it at our leisure. I trust you've no objection. Oh, uh, no, friend. Uh, none at all. Carried it on your back to the Grange. I did. I wouldn't have believed it possible had I not watched you every step of the way. Now, let's see what we have here. Would you uh, care to test my wine? Oh, gladly. Oh, these nuts are stiff. Oh, it's been in the river, hasn't it? Uh, this is made from pears. We had an excellent crop last year. I think you'll find it to your liking. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. I drink to your better success against all opponents but Hugh Berenger. Yes, it's good. Now, nearly done. There. What's this? A few oddments young Torold put together. I'll uh, fill your glass again. And I've been commiserating with you. I drink to your better success with all opponents. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Cadvile. <laughs> How did you do it? I mean, I watched you closely all the while. That's what I was counting on. If you can't shake off surveillance, the only thing is to turn it to your own advantage. And the real treasury? We hid it in a gnarled oak not far from the Grange. And by now, I hope, it's in Wales. Uh, no hard feelings? No, no, none. These, sir, uh, these oddments, what are they? A man's clothes? And what poor Nick Faintry was wearing when he was strangled. Oh, I begin to understand. You wanted to spring these on me when I was unprepared, thinking I might recoil from my own guilt. Shame, Cadvile. Did you think I'd commit murder for trash? Fitzalan's treasury? Trash? You can't read it, eat it, make love to it. You can buy the favour of kings with it. Uh, true. And when the chance offered... Uh... But, well, no great matter. It was a good fight while it lasted. Let's see. No, there's nothing I recognise here. Unless... The topaz. You know it? Well, hardly that. But I was with Aileen as she prepared her brother's body for burial. She spoke of something that should have been there that wasn't. A dagger that was hereditary in her family. This might well be the stone that tipped the hilt. Where did you get it? I found it trampled into the earth floor in the hut where Faintree died. It wasn't his, or Toro's, or... Oh, for God's sake, Cadval, you're not thinking Aileen's brother murdered Faintree. Has she to bear that, too? You're forgetting your sense of time. Giles Seward couldn't have murdered Faintree, for he was dead several hours before. No, it's rather that whoever killed Faintree had first robbed the body of Giles Seward and was wearing the dagger that he'd stolen when he set up his ambush in the hut. Which means the murderer was present at the executions. Aye, but left before the grizzly ended, for it went on into the night. And by then he was lurking in ambush at Frankwell. Can you name him, Brother Cadvile? I begin to have an inkling. But how do we get proof? <laughs> Brother Cadfile. Ah, Brother Pryor. There's news. 
King Stephen's army is about to march south towards Worcester. The king himself, with his personal guard, is to spend two nights here in the castle before he follows after. It seems he is disposed to forget any remaining grudges, for this Tuesday evening he has invited myself and Abbot Herbert to his table. Excellent news, brother. Uh, but how does this concern me? It seems a servant is required, and I have persuaded Father Abbot that this task should fall to you. You cope with the matter of the mass burial, even talked with the king concerning the unlicensed death. It's only sensible that you should be on hand to be questioned at need. I'll do it gladly. Good. Now, come with me. Uh, there are some errands to be run in the town. Master Flesher. Brother Catfire. The town puts on a festival fest. Yes. <laughs> Not so much in the king's honor, though. More to celebrate his early departure. <laughs> uh, what news of Goddith? She's safe away. Oh, tell Petronilla that I'll call and see her soon. God bless you, brother. <laughs> Spare something for a poor crippled brother, and... Hey, I remember you. You're the brother who bought me his cloak, aren't you? And uh, has it done you good service? Well, it surely has. And I've prayed for the lady, as you asked. But, brother... Yes? I feel sorely troubled. Why? Well, the man whose cloak this was. He's dead, isn't he? He is. Well, I fear I bear some guilt. For I saw the man living with this cloak about him the night before the town fell. And I was cold, and I wished the good Lord had sent me such a cloak to keep me warm. Oh, then soon after, you came and dropped it in my arms. Now, brother, what if I prayed the man into his grave for the sake of a cloak? Friend, you rest easy. His death isn't at your door. He was one of Fitzalan's garrison, executed with the other survivors when the castle fell. Fitzalan's man? Yes, indeed. And no sacrifice of yours could have saved him. But how can that be? I saw him enter and leave the king's camp that night. Are you sure of that? Aye, he was wearing this same cloak, with this same clasp at the neck. And I saw him come like a shadow among the bushes. And when they challenged him, he spoke up in a voice that shook with fear, asking to be taken to their officer, for he had something to tell to the king. What then? Well, they took him into the tent, and when he came out again, he looked more sure of himself. And I heard him say he must go back into the tent to avoid suspicion. Mm -hmm. But as he passed, he, he pressed a groat into my hand and begged me to say a prayer for him, which I did. But, brother, I'm still troubled about this cloak. Aileen's brother, a traitor? There's no escaping it. As if she hadn't had sorrow enough. You love her, don't you, lad? Yes, from the very first. Then try to feel pity for her brother. Pity? Poor, frightened boy who'd reached his breaking point. And we should grieve for him. He betrayed his friends to buy his own life. What with? Eh? What do you suppose he had to offer in exchange? What message did he take that night to the king's camp that was to the king's advantage? Of course, Fitzalan's gold. He was one of Fitzalan's officers. He'd have attended the council. He'd have known when and how it was to be moved. And what way would they ride but the shortest? Through the forest, past the woodman's hut? Enough to tempt someone in the king's camp to act on the information himself for his own gain. Ah, I bet he couldn't let Giles live, or the truth was bound to come out. So, when the king... He made sure that Giles was slaughtered with the rest. Sir so Giles fell victim to a treachery even greater than his own. Yes, you're right, Cadvile, I'm sure of it. I was speaking the other day to one of the Flemings who was present at the executions from first to last, and he told me that one young man was pulled from the ranks, incredulous, screaming that he'd been promised his life, that they should send and ask... Adam Corsell? I learned no name. You're Fleming. Did he notice the dagger? Was Giles wearing it when they strung him up? He was, for my man had an eye to it himself. Only when he came later to get it, it was gone. Aye. Corsell had taken it, and was wearing it later that day when he strangled Faintry. Why do you say so certainly, Corsell? He was at the battlements, but left early, so he had the opportunity. Also, I recollect the horror that fell on him when Aileen came to collect her dead. He said, if I'd known, I'd have saved him, no matter what the cost. Oh. I wonder what he's done with the dagger. Kept it, hidden it, got rid of it. 
We need it. Oh, that's for certain. I mean, it's our only proof. Without it, we can never bring Corsell to book. Uh, Catalan, uh, there's to be no trial. Huh? No trial. It's enough that Aileen mourns her brother. We must let her go on thinking he held to his choice, however mistaken, with honour to the end. Well, I understand your preoccupation, and I sympathise with it, but, but Nicholas Faintry mustn't lie uneasy for want of justice. Nor will he. That I promise. For Aileen's honour is both our weakness and our strength. Corsell wants high office with the King, and he wants Aileen as well. Where would he stand with either if the truth came out? No. He'll be as loath as we are for this murder to come to trial. What are you scheming? You'll see. At the King's table. Tonight. <laughs> your Grace! I'm loath to spoil your supper. There's a matter on which I beg you'll hear me and do right. Speak, Master Berenger. I demand justice on one here in the company who has stolen from the dead and committed murder. I stand on my charges to prove them with my body. Here is my gauge. What is this thing? The tip of a dagger hilt. The dagger to which it belongs was formerly in the possession of Giles Seward, a brother to the Lady Aileen Seward. Uh, Giles Seward was among those who garrisoned this castle against your grace and have paid the price for it. Yes. I say it was taken from his dead body, an act unworthy of knight or gentleman. That is the first offence. And the second? The murder of which your grace was told by Brother Cadvile after the count of the dead was made. What is this stone to do with that murder? Your grace, Brother Cadvile, who is present here tonight, will testify that he found it broken off and trodden into the ground in the struggle at the place the murder was committed. Brother Cadvile will take an oath, as I do, that the man who stole the dagger is the same who killed Nicholas Faintry, and that he left behind him, unnoticed, this proof of his guilt. Will Brother Cadfire step forward? Your Grace? Can you confirm finding this stone in the place where the killing befell? I can. And whose word do we have that it came from Seawood's dagger? The word of Lady Aileen herself. She recognized it at once. Very well. Then I'll accept that the thief is also a murderer. Name him. I name Adam Corsell. Adam? There's never a thread to connect him with the deed. I humbly thank your grace. My Lord King, I have proof positive of his guilt. This weapon was delivered into my possession a few short minutes ago. I pray you to match dagger and stone together with your own hands. Yes. There's no doubt they belong. How did you come by this? I was granted permission to distribute such morsels as were left of the banquet among the needy of the town. And at the gatehouse, I chanced upon a boy. He was carving some meat into small pieces, and he was using that knife. Uh, may I call him forward? Do so. Uh, come here, boy. Come on, no one will harm you. Where did you find the dagger? I fished it out of the river. And the sheath, too. I had to dive, but I found them. You didn't steal them? No, sir, they're really mine. The owner didn't want them. I saw him throw them away. Into the river? Yes, my lord. The same night the bodies were being carried down to the abbey. You're sure of this? I am. And would you know this man if you saw him again? I would indeed. Is he in this hall with us now? He is, my lord. That was the man. Adam Corsell. Your Grace, the child is lying. At whose instigation? Brother Cadfile? To what end? Then he's mistaken. I am not the man. I never had that thing in my possession. Never even saw it till now. I deny all that's been said against me. Then put it to the proof tomorrow. So be it. Very well. At nine o'clock, after mass, outside the town gate, on foot with swords. Is it agreed? Agreed. agreed. Hello, Tons, gentlemen. You. Oh, good morning, Brother Cadvile. I knew you wouldn't fail me. I'm excused all duties until the matter is resolved. Oh, that may take some time. Ah, yeah, he has weight, height, reach, all on his side. In my shoes, you'd have done the same and you'd know it. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Not on the guests of an old fool like myself. Cadvile, I know that you're not wrong. You, I can't regret what you're doing. 
And my arm will be seconding yours. Yes, well, no mention of this to Aileen until it's over. One way or the other. Depend on it. Never a word. Child, you shouldn't be here. Is it true what they're saying? That he who charged Adam with the murder of that young man and that Giles Dagger was the proof? It's true. And the charge is also true? That's true. But go now. You, you shouldn't look at this. I'll go tamely away and leave him. I didn't know it till now. But I love him, Brother Cadvale. Yes, Giles. So do I. <gasps> He's only half the other size. How could you let him do it? How could I prevent him? I can't see! Girl, it's better that he doesn't see you now. Is he hurt? No. Cosell is down. His sword's broken off at the hilt. What now? Cosell must fight on with just his dagger. Oh. What's happening? I can't see! Hills, put down his own sword. They're both fighting with daggers. Oh, he's mad! He gained the advantage and now he's thrown it away. Oh. Cosell has snatched Hills' discarded sword. So he can kill you at his leisure. Oh, well done, boy! They're struggling on the ground. One of them is rising. It's you! It's you! Well, Master Berenger, I was mistaken in the best man after all. Your Grace. No blow was struck that killed him. He fell on his own dagger. However, I trust I've proved my case. His deeds prove your case for you all too well. You? Oh, you, your hurt. Oh, hush, love. Don't turn tender on me now or I'm lost. But lend me your arm to lean on like a good wife should before I fall flat at the king's feet. <laughs> <laughs> Young man, you've robbed me of an able deputy sheriff. However foul a fighter. What if I appoint you in his place? Oh, with your grace's leave, I must first take counsel with my bride. Aileen? Whatever is pleasing to my lord is also pleasing to me. <laughs> ah. Was truth ever plighted more publicly? <laughs> You'd better invite the whole of Shrewsbury to your wedding. <laughs> I've uh, brought you a pot of goose grease for your wounds. Uh, <laughs> grazes, that's all. Oh, and uh, and this. Child Seward's dagger, miraculously repaired. Brother Oswald is a skilled silversmith. Oh. It's his gift uh, and mine uh, to your lady. Oh, I thank you both. So, at last it's over. Yes. But it isn't justice, is it? And between us, we're forced into the daylight the truth of one man's sins. It covered up the truth of another's. Hugh, justice is only half the tale. From the highest to the lowest extreme of a man's scope, wherever justice can reach him, so can God's good grace. Tonight at Compline, I shall pray for the soul of Adam Cursell. For every man cut down without time for repentance is truly one corpse too many. In One Corpse Too Many, the cast was Brother Cadvale, Glyn Houston, Goddess Aidney, Jane Slavin, King Stephen, Richard Tate, and Gilbert Prescott, John Moffat, Adam Corsell, Geoffrey Whitehead, Aileen Seawood, Joan Walker, Hugh Berenger, Ken Cumberledge, and Edric Flesher, Brian Miller. <laughs>